Hello, welcome to Jason Cabin Experience. Our guest today is Kate, Ju Kate Julia. Kate, you ready to be great today? I'm great. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kate, um, what do you do for fun? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Sort of softball question. I, start off. I, yeah, I was, I was ready for the, for the direct ones. For fun, I like to enjoy learning about others. Okay. And I love to read. I love romance novels. So how do you learn about other people? You just observe them? You do a full research project on them? Yeah, I'll read autobiographies, um, ask friends a bunch of questions. I love just being near people. When I was younger, I remember I was the type of person that would hang out at the mall and just watch. People observe? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. The interactions, the first dates, the, you know, the 10-year date. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love love. And so being able to see that through people's eyes okay. and their stories. So next, um, you used to do this open water, um, water, water diver stuff. Oh, open water dive. Yes. So um, I have done it a total of once. Um, well, like four, four or five days. I did it when I learned a couple of years ago, I went to Malta, the country, and I learned how to open dive. I got my certification so I can go out here. Um, so does that ever expire? Certification? It, it, um, it, it does and it doesn't, it's really good. Like when you are learning of, you know, if you haven't gone in a while, just go and do a class or make sure you have, you always have a buddy with you anyways. And then a couple of years later, if it has been a while and you haven't for, remembered everything, you know, you need to know the hand signals. It, it, it's your life and it's others people's lives at stake. And so if you don't feel prepared, you need to be able to be prepared. So what's the time period to do this? Like it's like month training, two month training, just one day. Yeah, I was in Malta. So it was four day training plus online stuff. So it takes about a week total to learn everything. Um, and what's the deepest you've been? The deepest I've been. I think we can go 30, 30 meters. Um, so I think we did like 30, 35. Um, I know we went five more than what we were supposed to yeah <laughs> you haven't done assistant um no i haven't because why not i i got pregnant just a month after okay. i learned and then so yeah now is about the time that i should go back out i've been you know i i, I nurse my daughter and so i don't like to be away from her for a certain amount yeah. of time and so it is you know it can be a half day or a full day event and okay. so when, um, when she's at that level where I can be gone <laughs> for a while, yeah. um, and had, I guess it was pretty fun to do. It was absolutely, it, it's amazing. Right. I mean, for, for people who have gone through trauma and to be able to experience, there's nothing else around you. There's your past doesn't matter. Your future doesn't matter. You have to live in the present because if you don't, it'd be pretty dangerous, I'm guessing. Exactly. Um, and so just having that experience of, you know, we're, we're humans on a ball of water. Uh, if people don't realize that, that, you know, especially like people like, like live on like, you know, middle of America, like you no know, water around, like there's like what, mostly water. People don't realize that. Yeah. And we're made out of 97% of water. So we're these humans made out of water on a ball of water, except we don't have gills. Um, and so the experience that we can actually be in the water, um, it's phenomenal. It makes you kind of want, like, you know, have all these ev evolution theories. Like, did we actually come from water, right? Did, like, millions of years ago, some small animal with gills like, come in the water and like, over the user, over user evolution means that you have, we have no gills no more? Well, and it makes me wonder if we were punished by the gods at once because, you know, we had this entire experience and then they took it away from us because we were too arrogant or ignorant, yeah. you know? It does make you wonder, right? Like yeah. between like the scientific, the, the science fiction and the, yeah. <laughs> all the, you know, conspiracy theories all there. Yeah. Um, so um, do you still have your, all, your, all your equipment or you had a, you rent it from that Malta place? I rented it. So you have to buy, you have to buy new equipment, I'm guessing. Well, you always need new air. Um, and then, yeah, so you just need a really good wetsuit, but pretty good wetsuits, uh, come at a big cost. I thought when I was, yeah. yeah, I thought when I was pregnant, I'm like, I'm just going to cut a hole out and then attach another, you know, and as the belly grew, um, but it was, yeah, so it was good. So I'll have to, I'll have to go out 
um, and get some more. I'm, I'm excited. I have a five year old and when she turns 10, I am going to take her. Oh yeah. Yeah. She's the whole reason actually I went. Do you, did you see any like, like crazy looking creatures or sea animals when you went deep, deep sea fish, deep sea diving? So I, so you get to see animals that are a completely different color, right? Freshwater versus sea. Um, and I've been, so I did see there is a barracuda um, and then this little shark. I've seen, seen okay. those. So that was, that was pretty chill, right? Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the, what freaked me out the most were there bubbles going up. What? Yes. Yes. You know, um, and so this little volcano and it just bubbles are shooting out of, you know, like they're just going up. And so it's, you're in the water. It's forming. Um, and so we all just stood there and y'all, we take a cheesy photo by it. But that, for some reason, just, you know, I could see all the different color fish. I can see a barracuda, but seeing bubbles yeah. come out of something in the middle of like the water. Yeah. Yeah. That, like, that what is this? totally fascinated me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that it's you know, like they say every, like almost every day they, they just discover a new, you know, animal in the sea they've never seen before. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's been more than 80. I mean, well, we can see that, see that study. But we know more about space, it seems like, than we even yeah. do. Yeah, I think water, you discover maybe like 10% of it or something, some world low number, you know. Yeah, that's why I love the Meg movies. Because if we go <laughs> in the deep sea trenches, I'm like, what do we know? <laughs> I mean, Atlantis could very well be down there somewhere, right? Yeah, and why would they want to touch us? And like, They'd be dumb to come with us. Yeah, and I could see why, you know, the hurricanes, the tsunamis, I mean. You know what? Here's coming crazy. Maybe the hurricanes are like the land is attacking us that we don't even know, right? Oh, oh my, completely, right? Why? I mean, if we actually learned how to respect the water, what what it would do back for us, you know, how would it treat us, and how were the animals treat us? And, and it's crazy if we could actually all do that and see. Yeah, good over there. Don't hold your breath on that one. <laughs> um, so with deep deep sea diving. You want to start doing it again? Where would you go to? I mean, like, like you go deep diving, deep, deep, deep diving today. Is that like any bucket list place you want to go to? Guadalupe. Guadalupe, okay. Sharks. Sharks. It's the home of the sharks. Okay, you want to go there? I love sharks. <laughs> <laughs> I do. So I would swim with some sharks. So I'm guessing you I walk. The, what's that thing? Because on that G, I think it's called Shark Week. Like shark Week. Oh yeah, yeah. That yeah. You, you you glue the TV then. Yeah, all of yeah, most of. Calendar gets blocked off. No one gets done. Kid don't bother me. <laughs> yeah, it gets to the point that my daughter will run up to people with shark shirts and make sure that she's like, Mom, shark, shark. <laughs> she's so excited to tell me that there's a shark. <laughs> any any favorite kind of shark? I love hammerhead sharks. So I used to have a company named Hammerhead. Um, and they can reproduce without males. So it's oh, pretty cool shark. <laughs> Um, and I love basking sharks okay. um, because all they're doing is sun tanning, yeah. you know. Um, and I, yeah. And do sharks only live in warm water or they're like all across the world in any kind of water, so to speak? They like warmer, but they're actually discovering um, the more deep in the south, mm -hmm. uh, like um, deep in the water, right? They're. They're discovering more. I don't, I don't they like kind of like birds have like migration patterns. They, they migrate to different places each year. Well, it's interesting. We actually don't know that much about sharks. And so I think in 2000, 2018 is when we discovered even a similar migration path as to where they are birthing okay. and why they're going places. But even as we track them, you know, They'll have some that they hang out in the Guadalupe and it's more of like their vacation spot, yeah. you know, and then they'll go up to California or they go up um, to Mexico and, but it's not the same every single year and they're not doing it together. I'm, I'm probably making this up. I remember a, a couple of years ago where there was a shark spot off the coast of Maine and people are freaked out, like, like there's never been a shark here before and this white, this big great white shark shows up the coast of Maine. Yeah, and I think there's more and more sharks that are going towards the northeast of America or like Nova Scotia. And, you know, partly maybe because, you know, they're going to attack us. So they're going to go through all the other ways. Yeah, um, they're, 
as a you know easier target up in the main yeah well they're also saying it's because our waters are warmer yeah and so they're just kind of moving they're going with the water so next talk about being yoga instructor certified yes um i i was certified when i was in college i have been doing yoga since before middle school it was my it was the only thing I couldn't feel like I could be perfect at because the lesson in yoga is that you need to be perfect at being imperfect um, or comfortable with the uncomfortable. And for me, I'm like, I need this in my life. And then my love of people. Why not teach others? And so can you talk about how hard yoga actually is? A lot of people, we don't think, you know, Oh, yo, you're just taking a stance. You're not really doing nothing. Can you talk about how the, the difficulty level of yoga? Yeah. Well, and I think it's the essence of yoga, right? Is you can make yoga as simple or as difficult as you can make it, right? But think about savasana, right? We lay down every single night before we go to bed. But how many of us cannot even do that correctly and are staying up and Three hours later, where your mind's racing, things pop in your mind. I think it's called monkey brain. I think where <laughs> your mind never starts off, nor what you try to do. Yeah, exactly. And so, if you get to the point where you're, you know, you're practicing daily, and say four years later, right, you're still, you know, you can be doing the same sun salutations that you've been doing for ten years, and your brain hits a block, and then it's that can be more difficult. Um, you know, there's the different types of yoga, vinyasana, where it's more sport yoga. You're getting there, hot yoga. You know, you're you're working to get a sweat, right? But where yoga came from, um, which is what I really appreciate it, is you're trying to hit, you know, let's say you're trying to hit nirvana, right? Well, uh, with yoga, you can't just sit there, right? And so they started forming these different poses to be able to open different spots in your body. So if your heart is closed or if you're holding a lot of pain in your shoulder, if you release that, then you would be able to like bring that thought and then um, let it go. Right. Um, but it's harder to reach if you can't, can't get it. Right. It's like, even when you're doing a massage, release it and that lets go. And so that's, that's, what's difficult about yoga for people. I mean, everyone can do it. How difficult is it for people just to shut off their brain? Yeah. So what are the benefits of doing yoga, either, either short-term or long-term? Um, so they've been having a lot of studies. It, there was a guy, he, um, he was a parachute, parachuter um, jumper in, in the Army. He, he, he um, skydived over 300 times. Well, after he got out, his, his spine was condensed. Um, very difficult to walk. He like either had to have a cane, but most of the time he was just in the wheelchair. So he came out and said, I have done yoga and now I can walk, right? You hear about those stories. Um, but there's also just simple stories of, you know, you're, you can lay on the ground here and you put, put your legs up and that will release the blood to your brain, right? I mean, it's super simple. Well, that can help heart disease because you're getting more blood to your heart. It can heart, uh, help depression because, you know, you're getting blood to your brain. It can help varicose veins because again, you're getting blood through your entire body. So you're just moving it around in um, ways that you typically wouldn't, especially in our day and age for sitting on a lap. So, so random fact, people don't know this though. People who are in the army, like do the, they're called paratroopers. Yeah. They, they lose an average of an inch over the army career. Because of jumping, right? Some lose as many, lose as many one to two inches off their height. Oh wow! If you don't realize it, yeah. And that's just condensing, yeah. right? So, um, am, I can ask, right? Yeah, yeah. So, how do, wait, like, does does the army, does the military have something set for them and practices not as they're really, getting out not of that? Because you know, nothing like like there's not not mandatory yoga. It's more like you know, suck it up, go jump again, right? You know, just, of course, it comes from they're jumping. Most of the things think skydive and just jump, you know, in the army, you have like maybe a hundred pounds of gear on your back, you know, your weapon. And so it makes it worse, you know? And then of course, if you're like, you know, say you're like five, 10, 200 pounds and somebody else is like five, eight, 135, a 
big guy is going to like, it's really do worse. It's going to like, you know, yeah. fall faster, you know. So do they choose specific smaller humans? Not really. It's just, there's really no primary reason to, you know, I mean, there's no, yeah. I mean, females do it, males do it, all sizes, all everything, you know. But the thing is, no matter what, you could be like a five foot, 90 pound female or six foot two, 240 guy. The, the what you carry is still the same amount, right? Yeah. So it's like, it doesn't matter. You, you still have to carry the same gear. Okay. Which is like, no, I would say maybe not unfair as a five foot person, you know. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Yeah, on their body. It's, it's interesting. Um, but even in America, we don't think of that as a holistic point of view of even you give birth and they're like, <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so, yoga, it was very, I know different kinds of yoga, right? There's hot yoga. I think there's something called goat yoga, I think, you know. Do people, what is, what is that like? You like, you do, you do, you do yoga with a goat or the goats on your back or something? Like, is that really a, a thing? Or was this like something made up on the cartoon? Um, yeah, I think it was one of those scenarios. You know, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, um, but it's a moneymaker. You know, let's do some yoga with some goats. Um, I mean, in Nepal, you know, they have their, their goats hanging out on the mountains. So maybe it's a little intertwined, but there's also, you know, there's dog yoga, cat yoga. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so do you, do you still teach yoga? So I do not officially teach yoga. Um, I am specialized with prenatal and postnatal, but, and I love my, my pregnant mamas, um, and teaching them. But I've learned more to practice it at home. Um, and then that's helping me then create, create birth. But anyone not do yoga? I was like, is there any like characteristics or like health conditions where they, that person should not do yoga? I'm not a doctor, but I think everyone in the world. Um, how does someone get like started in yoga? Is there something you have to do or you have to take a health test or you just join a yoga thing? I, I mean, we could do yoga right now in our chair. Put your legs up. Okay. Yeah. And then um, you can just put, I'm, I'm going to have you do yoga real quick. Okay. Okay. So your, okay. So you'll have your left knee. You can bend it in okay. and then you can put it on top of your right knee. So your left ankle will be on top of your right knee. Okay. And if you fit, there's kind of a little slot there. Hmm. Um, it's like your body's made to be able to form that. And then you'll just, so you'll just swing your right ankle underneath your left knee. So left over right. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And that's it. There you go. You're doing yoga. Okay. And you can do one knee. Uh, well, so while you're watching TV, while you're on your laptop. Um, and then Savasana. Everyone lays down. Okay. Is there such a thing as like a yoga national championships or anything like that? Or I, I don't kind know. Kind of yoga competition. You know, I don't know. Um, and I think it would be interesting about the yoga competition is, you know, so many people can move their bodies in so many different directions and ways. But how do we compete to say, hey, you've gone through a lot of trauma, right? Like, how do we truly get that competition of like, this person has gone through a lot, but can you meditate through it? Right. Um, I think then if we did that, we would kind of be getting into, yoga thing. yeah, we'd almost be getting into what with the Stanford studies. Remember those like the 1970s and they like tortured the kids. I don't oh, remember for, that. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, truly to get the essence of a yoga competition, we would be bringing out unethical. <laughs> yeah. That was a crazy, um, experiment mm -hmm. like the things people did in the 70s 80s were like what what were we doing yeah where you know you're just taking lsd right <laughs> yeah um so you still speak portuguese portuguese how you say it oh portuguese no but i have a tattoo you <laughs> do so i used to speak portuguese and spanish and a little bit of french um and then i had babies and I used to play the ukulele. Um, so those are my things that. You still play that? No, nope. then I had a baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah Babies can be time because we no doubt about that. 
So you pick and choose um, what you like to do. And what we are going to start learning is that um, now all of us five and my youngest, um, she's one. We're going to start learning Sanskrit in the house. Okay. Yeah. And we, so you got two girls? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll be learning. Um, yeah. So we'll be studying Sanskrit and, you know, doing that towards our meditation practice. I figure that would be kind of a fun thing to do. Yeah. Um, and then maybe one day I'll live in Brazil for a little <laughs> bit and get, get my language back. Um, how, how, so how did you learn that language? An ex-boyfriend. Ex-boyfriend. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, this, I was in college in this beautiful Brazilian. Of course I'm going to learn that <laughs> language. <laughs> like, yes. <That's> uh, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to speak to his mom. Uh-huh. Get on, you know. That's a good reason. Yeah, get on the good side. And are you still involved with the Girl Scouts? Oh, wow. Wow. No. No. Back in college days. Yeah, that was, I was part of a sorority, actually. And we, we volunteered a lot with the Girl Scouts. Now, I've been thinking about getting my girl in the brownies. And so I think we'll be, be in the brownies. But yeah, again, you, you figure out what's important in your life and the timing that you're going with yeah. it. One thing about you, like you seem like you've done all the experimentation with a whole different lot of stuff, right? Most people, they, mm-hmm. they do one thing the whole life, you know, where, like they do one thing, like you experiment, so to speak, like you discover what you want to do. I think it's great. Yes. My motto is you never know until you try. And so if you don't like something, or at least, you know, if you do like something, if you don't have the time for it, and what is your priority at that moment in time, you can always go back to it later. And at least you have the knowledge of doing that, right? Like, even if you never go deep sea diving again, right? you have the knowledge experience, you know, if you had that, that experience, right? Like no one can take away from you that, that day you spent deep diving in, in Malta, right? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. That, that whole week was, um, it, it that whole week rewired parts of my brain that I needed. So what's something on your bucket list you want to do but haven't done yet? Like, I don't know, like run a marathon, travel like 20,000 countries. Like what's something out there comparable deep sea diving that you want to do? So I've ran a marathon. Of course you have. <laughs> yeah, of course you have. Of course. Um, it was the international Detroit um, to Canada. And so it was over the bridge. I've heard of that. Through I've the tunnel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've done that. Um, I, of course, would love to travel to every single country. That's no doubt in my mind. Um, I would like to sail around. I think once, once the girls are older, that's almost like my retirement yeah. plan. Um, I, one thing that I have in my bucket list is I want to live in France and learn. I want to go to pastry school. Okay. And I want to just do it for me. So just down the block, it's a place, I can't remember the name of it, that it's actually a pastry school. It's a nonprofit pastry school, right? Two, two minutes from here. I'll take you there once you get over so you can check it out. Okay. And they teach, like, people how to cook pastries. Real, oh, my goodness yeah. gracious. So I, I love desserts. Like, I mean, I can eat a dessert. I mean, if, if you see me crabby, <laughs> just hand me a macaroon, it's done. <laughs> um, so I think that would be pretty cool. Um, but, yeah, I would love to go check it out. And then in college, you learned 14 programming languages? I did. I, like, how's that even possible? Like, did you, like, not sleep at all? Or do you, like, blow off your classes? Like, 14 programming languages? And, and you said, and you had, like, five you were really good at? Yeah. So I ended up um, falling in love. I didn't know that programming, like, I knew it was a thing, but I, I had my five, ten-year plan, right? And I took a class. Um, and it was just to learn HTML and CSS and Java, like super simple. Right. And I caught it on like nothing. I mean, it, it was the first time and and I've, I've had different classes that I really loved, like anthropology, critical thinking, um, were phenomenal classes, right? My major was accounting at the time, still ended up getting it. I would never imagine a thousand years that you, you, that you, you started accounting. That is so unlike you when I've seen so far, right? Like using account, no, that's like a, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I ended up getting, um, when I graduated, I um, worked at Deloitte. So the largest accounting in the firm in the world. Um, but I, you know, I did it. Um, and we, we can, actually, I'll, so I'll tell you that real quick. My, I made a business plan 
when I was in fourth grade and I still have it. It has six cards, like a five by six cards, right? My business plan, it was a spa community center in New York City. I showed it to my mom. And this also explains probably how I grew up and me as a whole. My mom said, this is beautiful. This is a great plan. But why don't you study accounting so you don't get screwed over financially? <laughs> and so um, I studied accounting and then I got a job at the largest accounting firm in the world. So a little bit how I work. So do you still do coding on the side or keep up with it in the past? No. So I, I love coding. Um, I, I'm doing the coding for my current company right now. Uh, I've created a couple of apps for my daughter. Didn't push them out, um, but they were kind of her secret thing. I should have pushed them out before COVID because I'd be like sitting a little bit higher with my cash <laughs> right now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, um, it, it's my, I don't know if I could imagine having a, per se, a boss with coding yeah. and being like, you need to do this. And, and I did that for a year, but love just creating and figuring out how I can create. So what languages do you use now? Mm, yeah. So this obviously HTML, CSS, Java, JavaScript, um, C sharp, Python. I do like the flutter, uh, like flutter, forgetting the what's next to the package with it, but yeah, so it's flutter language. Um, so those are mainly what I'm using for when I do. Things. And how do you keep it up to date with, all, with everything? I know it seems like those things change like almost daily for the new updates and stuff. Yeah, but you can always create what you want, right? I mean, it's the one thing. There's someone out there who can always probably do it faster, better, you know, than you. But we're still creating what you're creating. And so I, you can always keep up to date, but there's a lot of code that's not ever going to that's not ever going to change. So it's just depending on what you are building. Now, the processing and the different algorithms that are coming out, you can always add a package that just was released. So how often do you spend coding each week on an average on estimate? Hmm. Well, maybe 10, 10 to 15 hours. Okay. Um, just and you go like code 15 hours at one time, but keep in the zone or you like you break it up? Oh, Lordy. Okay. If the girls weren't around, <laughs> hands down, I'd. I'm the 15 hour at once coder uh, with the girls around. It's more so when they go to bed and I, I code for a little bit and creating what I want to create. So your girls are five and one year old, you said, right? Mm -hmm. So are you going to like, how to put this like, are you going to like, you know, try to overtly influence them to do certain things? Or are you just not, are you going to open up all possibilities and then pick what they want to do by themselves? The only thing that I am wanting them to do is have the presence of a healer whenever they are around him. Um, I want them to be genuinely nice and empathetic. Um, if anything else they do, I want them to enjoy life. Um, I, I was always told you needed, I needed to be the best or I needed to have stability. And I think for my girls, you know, I really want them to be happy. Well, what if they're happy? What do they say they're happy? You're like, okay, how can you be happy doing this, right? Like, suppose they say I'm happy, like, you know, I don't know, walking to McDonald's as a waitress or something like that. Are they hurting anybody? No. Then I'm happy for them. Okay. I'm absolutely happy for them. If they are happy with what they are doing, I... Even they don't seem like on a on a successful lifestyle or like they don't you know. Mm, no, yeah. I I do not think success brings happiness. Um, I think what the inner work does. Now I definitely think a good amount of package of money yeah. sounds great for everyone in the world, but like yeah. honestly, is it a package of money that we all need, or do we just need to make sure that we have stable housing, clean water, and good food? Yeah, right? and a community. I remember reading somewhere like you know like. I think seventy thousand dollars like the magic number amount, right? If you make seventy thousand a year, everything's like happy. And actually, if you make more than seventy thousand, your happiness actually goes down. 
I don't think they calculated uh, Seattle because seventy thousand dollars here is definitely in the poverty was, line. I, mean, I think it was an it must have been apartment in Nashville after or something. You know, I remember the yeah. number seventy thousand. Yeah, that's like in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a master's in entrepreneurship from the University of Washington. I do. And when, what year did you get that? Uh, during COVID. So, so it was all on. I mean, online probably. All online. Yes. The first trimester, we were really hoping. We all were like, "Yes, we're ready to be in person," and then. We eventually got told it was just going to be online. So what can a school teach about being an entrepreneur? When people say you want to be an entrepreneur, I actually got to go start a business, learn the mistakes. What can a college teach you about being an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, so all I can say what I got out of it, right? Um, I got the confidence. I got the support. I got the strategies. And I think that's what we can get from school. And it's always what you can get out of school. Right. I didn't come from an entrepreneurship family. I came from a very stable nine to five. Um, you get the, the degree and you work 30 years and then you retire into a house and, you know, and that's what you do. And so I wasn't surrounded by entrepreneurship people, but academia, I knew. And so I think being part of a school program, um, it, it, yeah. It gave me what I needed to do to feel like I could start a company. And I started a company through it and it failed. And do you know how good it feels to start something and then fail it? Like to know that I finally, I mean, since fourth grade, I've wanted to start a company and I started it and failed it. But I still had my dog pack surrounded by me and being like, yes awesome. Like let's pivot or start a new something or what do you want to do with your life? Right. And I had the tools to be able to see what I wanted to do. Is, a, is it a one-year program or two-year program? One year. One year. And like do most people like, you, you, I guess you start a company during the course, you go the whole process of starting it and doing that kind of stuff. Or how does that work? Yeah. I think a lot of people, um, so half people had their ideas and the other half just wanted to work for a startup. So I had like 27 ideas. <laughs> so by the time uh, we graduated, I had to hone in on one. And so that just depends on what you would like to like to do. You can help others or create your own. So what's, what is human-centered design? Is that the like same as like UX, UI design or something completely different? No. Um, I love this. I love this example. Human-centered design is... We have adult toothbrushes, right? And so then they just came out and they made it smaller and they gave it to kids, right? Just a smaller toothbrush. Kids were not brushing their teeth. They're like, oh, it's because they're kids. Or, you know, it's like the parents not doing it, right? Like, no. So a company came in and tested with kids and realized it was hard for them to grip the toothbrush, right? Because it was just a big one to a smaller one. And they made it um, like a little bit, a little bit bigger on the bottom, a little bit kind of like a snowman, you know, um, for them. And they could grip it and kids were brushing longer. So that is human centered design. You know, we're designing, we are asking the humans, okay, what is going to actually make your life not easier? Not saying, hey, this is what you need. Take it. And then we're going to fault you if you're not using it. And doesn't University of Washington have like one of the top human center design programs in the, in the world? Like, or like top notch? Yeah. 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 Even their, their master's of entrepreneurship, they're, um, they go back and forth between one and two with MIT. Okay. So, and same thing with their HCDE school. Um, it's phenomenal, phenomenal programs. So you got a, you had a good experience there? Oh my God. Yes. Um, days I wish I was still in the program. Oh, we all wish we were still in college. <laughs> Go back in time, like dummy, stay in college as long as you can. Don't go in the, <laughs> go in, we'll go in the real world. Yeah, I get that. So, um, can you talk about your your role at KPMG? Yeah. Okay. So you're leading the robotic process automation within text text technology. On the one hand, robotics sounds sexy and innovative. And text, like, how do you combine those two together? Oh, yeah, I know. Think of my personality. Who would have thought that my main job is text and technology, Never. right? Yeah. <laughs> Half me still don't believe you. <laughs> um, yeah. So I find great. Mm, talked to a psychic the other day said, I'm in on this world. I'm a 
qualifier and Aries in every different perspective, right? And one of the things that really upsets me and that gets my ball of fire really big is inefficient processes. I hate that. I hate that shit too, right? It's just like, you, I mean, like you've done this same way for 10 years. You know, it's not right. Take the effort to improve it. Right. I mean, we say, oh, it's not my job or I don't have the time or blase, blase, all these excuses. Like, just take some time to improve it and then your workload will be so much better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Completely. So learn a language, make a friend. And say, hey, how can I make this to this? I mean, you can even log into programs. You can start your computer, log into the programs that you need to log in, have the computer do very simple things that you need to have it do. By the time you got your coffee, came back to your desk, and then you can actually start then moving on to the next steps. And we're not doing that as humanity and we're not supporting each other. And so, um, no, that's what I do. So how did this happen? On here, it says that you reduce workflow from 120 hours to 11 seconds. Yes. How is that even possible? Like, what did you do? Okay. Imagine a lot of Excel sheets. And so you have, and this happens all the time. That's not, I've done that for like several handfuls of companies. This is kind of, kind of common. This is everyday work for you. So, super common. Everyone else, some superstar stuff. <laughs> Employer of the year. You're like, yeah, that's no big deal. <laughs> super, super simple. Um, so imagine you have like a thousand, um, a thousand Excel sheets that you have, like, like documents. So you, you have a company. So say, okay, let's do this. You have a parent company. And underneath the parent company, you have a thousand different companies. And so every single month you're getting an Excel sheet from them and you need to pull three different numbers and you need to compare it to last year's number. And then you need to get the FIFRs, the gap, because it's international. So you need to be able to have the different regulations. And then you want to get a couple other numbers to see like how your ROI is doing, right? So that is what the process is doing. Think about when a human does it. They open the sheet, they find the Excel, and it's always the same Excel, you know, box, right? So you open it, you look at it, and then you look at a different sheet, you look at that number, you look at a different number, and then you put it over here, right? Really all you're doing, but you have to do it a thousand times over. So all you're doing is telling the computer, do these four steps, once you make it happen a second time, you can go from two to a thousand. You're done. The program will do it for you. Easy peasy. <laughs> can you talk about this? Like, it's like Excel, for example. Like any, any tech, Excel, Google, Worksheets, whatever you want to call it. Like, most people only use it maybe one, two percent of what can be actually user, right? So, I watched on uh, YouTube the other day. This guy made a, a somehow he made like a, some kind of video presentation using just Excel, right? It, it, you know, like, can you talk about how people like really don't use? tech as, as, as they should, all the possibilities out there. Well, I mean, look what just became super popular in the world, right? I mean, you can put, oh, I remember being so nervous to talk to, you know, a future boyfriend, future significant other. You didn't even know how to text them, right? And now you can say, hey, this is my personality. This is their personality. These are our interactions. Can you give me a step by step of how I can like ask them to the movies, right? And then what should I text them? I mean, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> um, so the amount of technology in the world, um, yeah, but it's endless. So with all this advancement in tech, do you think that we're actually getting smarter as a human race, or is the tech just advancing so fast we're like basically the same level of smartness since the beginning of time? I don't think tech has anything to do with it. I, I think it's the community aspect that we don't have with humans anymore. Um, and our IQ, I mean, what do we, we only access 4% or something? Like yeah, something 4%, 10%, it's like, yeah. Of our brain. And we don't know, maybe there's a theory as to we are only accessing 5% because we need to excel our technology that much more. And then once our brain can do the basics, then we can even access more to our brain, right? I mean. Or maybe we, our brain is spent too much time using like, you know, menial tasks, right? Like example, when I was growing up, you remember, you knew everyone's phone number. Mm -hmm. yeah, 
like I can remember seven dishes to save my life now, right? Yeah. Because I don't need to, right? I can do different things now. Yeah. And so what if your brain then wasn't using just to remember the seven digit number, but it's using to figure out, okay, I'm going from the moon to like what's we discovered a new galaxy the other, you know? Like everyone gets discovered every day. Right. Yeah. So now we're like, okay, we have a map on our head and you know, this or like a glowing map. I mean the world is endless, right? I, I don't think our IQ level goes down with technology um, or even what we're doing, right? I mean, yeah, we can be smarter, but I think humans just need to learn how to also be a village and support each other. And then that way, then the creation of technology wouldn't be the doomed. So you also mentor like different people. How do you, what's your process for mentoring people and training people? Oh, I love this. Love this. It depends on what I'm doing or how long I have. Um, but if I'm bringing someone on to uh, my company, I always do a 30, 60, 90. And each, um, that 30 date mark or around that mark, depending on where that flow is with them and how they're doing, do I see where they're at? And I've taken people who have a finance strict background and then within the 90 days, they were my lead sustainability person, right? Because that's what they were passionate about. That's what we talked about more. That's what really got them happy. And so I think just, I love being able to understand people from where they are and teaching them how they need to learn, right? Like never get mad at someone because you're talking to them. And then you get mad at them, but because what you need to draw a picture for them, right? Like, so that's, that's why I love mentoring people. So speaking of course, in generalities, how long or how small, small time does it take you to figure out if someone's going to be a superstar or someone like, no matter how much time you spend with them, they're never going to get it. Well, I mean, we can all be superstars, right? I don't know. Some people. Yeah. Some people, I don't know. Oh, I love the, what Einstein's quote, um, if you teach a, uh, fish to swim, he's never going to be able to do it. Right. Um, and so I think everyone has a piece to the puzzle, but where do we fit them? And it depends on how long they want it, but someone could have such a natural ability, but that only gets you so far, right? You have to have someone who wants it. And if you have someone that wants it, that's how you can get to stardom, right? Um, you give them that intrinsic and that extrinsic value. If they're getting that and they want it, stardom is born. But if they're not wanting it, you can't yeah. do anything with them. So I watched this video the other day and like this guy was talking about this basketball player named Vince Carter, right? He was talking about how upset he was with Vince Carter because he didn't live, he had had all the skills. He was more skilled than Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. Yes, naturally talented, could do everything well. But he just didn't want it like other people did. He didn't have that want to, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had a 20-year career, made a lot of money, but they were like, man, if you just, if you just sort of had that half the want that Kobe Bryant did, he would be like the number one player of all time, but he didn't want it. Oh, I could see that with so many people in the world. And the reason as to why they don't want it or why people choose the path that they do, I mean. You think it's just simple wiring, how we are, or like background, or like being pushed by parents? Or, why, like, why do some people like have it, so to speak, other people don't? I think it's the support that they have around us. And what they're told is the value of life that we have. Um, you know, um, actually, I have a brother. And this is something that a lot of people don't know. And my, my brother passed away a little bit ago. And he was a phenomenal soccer player. One of the best in the world. But through different circumstances, he thought that money was the best thing that you needed to get in the world, right? And it took them down a bad, bad path. And so when you have different people who have just raw talents and someone who's supporting them gives them an idea like, oh yeah, you're going to be this professional soccer player. You're going to have a lot of money and you're going to have a lot of girls, right? Like their extrinsic and their intrinsic value changes, right? And like really, why are they doing it? What are they trying to prove to the, themselves and to others and what makes them whole? So I think it can be different, a different approach for, for each person. And was it the egg or the chicken for him? I don't know. 
Yeah, you never know what, motiv- what motivates people. Like, I don't, I remember in, I remember in junior high school, in the seventh grade, we had a guy in the seventh grade. He could run like a 100 yard dash, like 10.2, 10.3, right? He would, he would, he went against high schoolers. By the time he was 20, he was in prison, like 20 years for burglary and robbery stuff, right? Yeah. Because if he was around. And yeah. All the time in the world. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Fast money, quick, right? I mean, that, that's what happens. And so, and then you get two people born out of the same circumstance. And I was phenomenal. Yeah. And how about this? Like, I've talked about this before. Like, you could have like a, how you would think like you would have, like, you have like four kids in a family, right? But they all turn out differently. One might be a successful, one might go to prison. Like, even though they're raised the same way, same parenting styles, four kids, they can turn out so many different ways. I've always, I've always been amazed at that. Well, yeah, it's the same. It's, um, the, I read something a little while ago. It's two guys and one never drank alcohol in his entire life. And they said, well, why didn't you drink alcohol? Well, because my dad's an alcoholic. And the other guy, he became an alcoholic. And I said, why are you an alcoholic? He said, because my dad is an alcoholic. I remember that story, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, I mean, who, yeah, I, I, we have no idea, right? But I think it is willpower. I think it's mind over matter of saying, this is the person I want to become. And what are the daily actions that I'm going to put force forth to see the life that I really want to live? And do you still, is Kate Logic still a company or is that? Yeah. So that's, that's essentially my overall, my patents sitting there. Okay. More of an IP, IP holder. Then I get to have my creativity. Uh, so my contracts and everything. So what, what does that do? What, what is Kate Logic? Yeah. So it's, it's just more of my holder of my contract. So when I'm talking or am I creating an idea or testing out something, I like, I have a bunch of models then I can write the contract with my Kate Logic company. And then if it's something that spuns out, um, then I am able to then just create that company wholly. It's more of like a holding company, so to speak. Or- yeah. It's a holding company okay, for my thoughts, my creative ideas, um, and protection. So you protect all your stuff. Like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, that's my, that's, that's my love. That's my enjoyment. That's, um, Everyone always said it's Kate Logic when I was growing up. So that's why it's called that. Because <laughs> um, I always thought differently. So how long did it take to do 1,200 customer discovery reviews? How long? Is that like a, of a, a, your, like a two, three, four year process? You like cram a wall in like 12 days? No, no. I think I did it with like three months. Three months, okay. Yeah. Um, you get like a bunch of people together and fill out the sheet. And well, then- they... Well, well, the customer was like a certain project you're doing, like was like different things. I had three different projects I was okay. doing. Yeah. Um, so I sent out a couple. Love it when I send out my Google forms to people and ask them questions. And they're like, talk about an MVP. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was um two of them were Google Forms. Um, rest were just, you know, like 60 people and we talked. Why do you think so many startup founders skip customer discovery? So many people like I'm going to build a product, the world's going to buy it. And then no one does, right? Because they don't do customer discovery. What do you think so many people like skip that start? Because is it hard to do? Is it like too easy to do? Like, what do you think? My first thought, maybe they have a little bit of narcissism in them. You know? Probably like 95% <laughs> accurate, yeah. That's probably right, yeah. Um, they're like, this is what I know would work for me. So it's going to work for everyone else, right? Um, the other thing, I think that's what's phenomenal about my program that I learned. It, they really honed in on customer discovery and they're like, hey, sounds like a great idea, but who's actually going to buy it? Um, and so that, I think that's pretty good. So what's your process of doing customer discovery? Like how, like, how do you like research? How do you know what, what person to pick? Like what's the whole process for you? Like, how do you know how long it's going to be? How many questions? Yeah. Like in Zoom, in person, is it better? All that kind of stuff. I first draw my ideal customer. I go through the day. I go through the through the year. You know their emotions. What do they wear? When do they wake up? And those emotions. And I try to then find people that hit um, several of those aspects. Right. So if they're parents or if they're kids, depending on who they are. But I draw them. I want to visualize them. And then from there, I see who I know that's like that. And then I just send them a couple text messages like, hey, how's this idea or 
does this happen for you? And then from there, um, I will get my prototype ready and then push that out to um, at least 100 people. Is there like an uh, optimal time limit to talk to someone? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I, you know, I probably should know that because I'm the type of person that just talks and could just hang out. You know, I'm, I'm from the Midwest. We would say it's the Midwest goodbye. You say <laughs> goodbye and then like 15 days later, we've shown you our scrapbooks <laughs> and all, you know, like, um, yeah. So is it the time limit? I think people in Seattle, a little smaller. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so when you do dis- discovery interviews, how do you influence people actually do it with you? Because like, people are busy, they're doing stuff like CDs that send, to, like you send out two texts, you got stopped after that where they get no reply. Like, how do you influence people like spend like 20, 30 minutes with you doing this? Um, yeah. So I've gotten messages from people and saying, this is a really long questionnaire. I'm only filling this out because I like you. And I'm like, okay, cool. Thank you for filling it out. I appreciate you. <laughs> so I've gotten that answer, but a lot of it's incentivization. So I've had people with me for three days straight and we're just going back and forth with testing different products and seeing how they feel about it um, and everything at, at that aspect. And from the end of it, they got all of the product that they got to touch and feel and they felt like they were heard, right? People want to be asked questions. So if you ask them a thousand questions, they feel like they're important and then they get to brag about it. By So you did 1200 interviews over three projects. So that you did like, so it's like what, 400 interviews per project, but am I correct? Uh, yeah, there was one of them. I, I probably did more of like eight. So why, why so many? But most people will say only do five, 10, 20. Why do so many? Well, you know, it's funny. It's the one that I did around 800. It was the total is a company I launched and failed. So it's really intriguing of, you know, you can do the customer discovery. You can get the opinion yeah, for but people. What's the, what's the limit, right? What's like, you did a hundred interviews. Are you just like in information over and over again? Like when you stop and like move to the next part, so to speak. Oh yeah. To the next part. Um, yeah. So, well, through customer discovery, you do have the different segments, right? You're like, you, what's the pricing? What's the material? It, you have multiple different stages to get to that um, full product of saying, hey, this is what I'm selling. Would you buy it for? Well, speaking of pricing, any recommendations on people like get their pricing right? I, I've heard like, you know, whatever you, whatever you charge, you should charge at least three times that much because you're undervaluing yourself. But then you're like, I can't charge too much. I'm, I'm a startup. You know, no one's going to buy this for, you know, X amount of money yet, you know, so yeah. balance that. You know, I've heard it. People too is uh, people are charging four hundred dollars for something that's two dollars. And honestly, I mean, you want to make money, but it, what, why? It has to be some kind of ethics in there, right? Yeah, I, and they're like just like well, you hear all the time like during like hurricanes, people sell you know charge a hundred dollars for a bottle of water, yeah, something like that. You know? Oh, can you open this by the way? Yeah, thank you. I um messed up my thumb. Thank you. You're um, yeah. And they say it's prestige, right? Like, oh, it's this phenomenal. It's a phenomenal, you get to feel fancier. It's being sold to the richer people of Seattle. Like what this t-shirt's five bucks, but if you put, you know, some fancy name on it, that's a $500, you know? Yeah. I mean, that sounds really not the type of aspect I would like to go on in this world. Um, so for my pricing, I try to get, I try to see what do I need to be able to survive on for the year? You know, what am I, how do I get my, my basic needs met? How do I get my team? How do I get their basic needs met? And I have the product and then what can I grow from there? And I don't want to overcharge right now. I mean, my prototype, if I pushed it out at the price that it's at right now, I'd be losing $50. But I want to get to that price because I want it to be more accessible to everyone. And so, you know, if I end up making ten or fifteen dollars on each product, I think it's then my job to make more surrounding opportunities around it, right? Um, I, I don't think, especially if you're having a product that is helping people, rich people are not the only people that need help. So. So what's, what's, what's a good process for someone to build out their MVP? 
like how advanced your MVP it should be like an MVP minus. Should I have all the bells and whistles? Like what actually in your mind is an MVP? Well, it's interesting. I've gone multiple di different directions. Um, I, I showcased my product a couple months ago and it had three different versions, right? Um, but it didn't have everything in one, one item together. Cause I'm like, well, like that would cost a lot of money right now. And so I just want to see what people are liking on those different aspects. So you can do something like that. Um, the next one that we're going to be putting out, it is most of those things combined. The one after that is going to be all the bells and whistles and more, because that's the one that then we're going to finally have to hone down on every single thing that we need for the final product. Um, so I think when getting the MVP, if you can make it sustainable and accessible, it's good to have all the bells and whistles because then you can cut the things off if you need it. But like, they don't, they can be duct taped bells and whistles, you know, if that makes sense. So how do you decide this? Like you're talking about people being narcissists, right? Probably you have like, my products should have like X, right? And you like do MVP 10 people, all those 10 people say, I don't know, like eight of 10, I don't know about this X thing, right? You should take it off. But you mind like, this is like, you should have it on there. How do you like have enough, uh, how do you be humble enough to say, okay, I need to listen to my customers to take this thing off versus, okay, I know my mind, I should have this here. It's been part of my, you know, core vision forever. Like, how do you like be humble enough? That's the right word to do that. You know, You have to listen to the customer. I mean, if it's the product you're building for them, you don't have to be humble, I guess, as a person when you're like, when you're successful, I, I, I mean, but you still need to be humble. So I, you know, I, that's, then they should probably work on that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it is working through the insecurities that you have in yourself to say, hey, I've had this amazing idea. It hasn't worked, but my team and my customers have told me it shouldn't be on there. How much does it cost to keep it on there and my pride? Or does it save me money and it's still a really good product and it doesn't have to be on there? And so the K logic you've like gained over two hundred thousand dollars done like doing research and development. Like what kind of research, what kind of development is like is like two hundred thousand dollars over the lifetime look of K logic, one time payment, different companies? Um, yeah, so it's been different different companies, different research. Um a lot of it's more geared towards like kids and how to help kids. Uh, a lot of it's trauma healing focused. Uh, and then some of it was some lingerie. So, you know. <laughs> What's been your most fun research project you've done? Maybe maybe not most fun, but like most um, spoken for, like most um, enhancing, most um, fulfilling, most fulfilling thing you've done. Okay, so those are two very different answers. Um, the most fun was this relationship app I did. Um, that was just talking to people about their relationship, how they felt their personalities, their other, their partner's personalities. That was a lot. Like, I, again, I love love. The most fulfilling is what I'm working on right now. Um, and helping kids and trying to find the best way to help them is, is why I'm here. I think it's really why I'm, it's what I'm supposed to be doing this lifetime around. So change the subject a little bit. You just did a trip to New York City. I saw you post on Instagram. You look so happy there, like the stuff you're doing. Can you talk about the trip or what you did there and all the fun you had? Oh, my goodness gracious. New York City is my favorite city in the world. It always will be, always has been. Um, my, my heart, my heart is in New York City. And um, I went for a bachelorette party. <laughs> like, literally for... It was so cool. I've known her since middle school. I got to see her friends. I got to see her sister. And it's just really cool um, experience. And so I got in. It was just 24 hours. I needed to make sure I wasn't gone that long away from, away from my babies. And so flew in. We went and got, of course, the New York City bagel. We went to Time um, we went to Times Square, we did Central Park, um, 
we were in the middle of a parade. I mean, we did the New York things, right? We went to a Broadway show. We ate Indian at 2 a.m. Yeah, you know, like we did we did the things that you do in New York. Um, which is great. <laughs> a great blessing. time. Huh? Blessing. Absolute blessing. Nice. And then talk about what you do with the, something called Autism Speaks. Yes. So I used to volunteer with them for a couple of years and then they, they closed on the program and I worked with a senator and um, finding different initiatives for um, kids with autism. And are you still involved with them? No, because they closed down the program. Okay. Yeah. And so you still do stuff with autism as far as like different nonprofits or just personal ones? Uh, yeah. So everything that I've learned in the past, um, my, my daughter was diagnosed couple years ago, three years ago. So through all the research, I got certifications with um, autism, being a caregiver for an autistic child and, you know, learned the the benefits and that are surrounded through autism. And that is um, also a, a path that I think led me on to being able to create. So what is way. autism? Autism is just the way, you know, they don't think. They think differently. Being inside of her world, I mean, it's a blessing, absolute blessing. I mean, all is just a, yeah, we all think a little bit differently, right? And sometimes she needs a little bit more help, but I mean, we all do. Is it, is it like, is it genetically passed on from generation to generation or like, how does that work? If you were to ask my current husband, he would say yes, and it comes from my side. <laughs> um, you know, my mom became a mechanical engineer before it was popular for women to be Emmys. Um, I, everything is a perfect puzzle for me. Um, I've, of course, even Kate Logic, right? I think outside of the box. I always have. I always will. I'm fine. Give me, hey, how do you get from here to here? And I will think of all of the different ways. And so, yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't really know where it comes from. Um, chicken and the egg, right? And so, like, how does, like, someone, have, like, is that, so, like, how does one get diagnosed? Like, does the parent say, my, my kid is not acting right, they think of autism test, is like a test they take every year automatically? Like, how does someone, I, 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 I don't oh, wow. ever take my kid saying, hey, go get an autism test, right? Yeah. How does that come about? So, they actually have you fill it out. Not exactly the, the name. It's like something chat. Um, but when you go to the doctor just for your pediatric visits, um, so they set you up and they just ask you questions, you know, out of these like 12, are they like hitting those? And so they give you the answer. Um, so my daughter went, I'm pretty sure it's 12. Um, but I know that by the time she did it, when she was, two years old, she was only answering four of them. Um, so she was, um, she, she spoke 40 words and then she stopped. And throughout that process, then she, different stimming. Um, but I had her in speech therapy because she wasn't, um, she only said mama. And it, so we had her in speech therapy and then they said, Hey, check out of a, check out a visual, um, like a visual calendar. Right. So I looked it up on Pinterest and it always was tagged with autism. And so we went the next time and I said, Hey, you know, she's low on this chart. You guys want me to do a visual calendar, like a visual schedule. Right. Um, and it's saying autism and they're like, yes, how do you feel about that? And I'm like, doesn't change my kid, still my kid. And they're like, okay, well, then we think she should get tested. So it was actually her speech therapist okay. who suggested it. And then I went to the pediatrician and they then did the test again, just to make sure that nothing changed within a couple months. And they, they also. And once agreed. you get diagnosed with autism, you ever get rid of it or it's like, it's with you the rest of your life. It's always with you. Okay. Yeah. But you have high functioning. You've there's like three levels, one, two, and three. Three, you need more support. Two, you need less. And then one, more high functioning. Do you happen to know what percentage of the population has this? 
No, but they are saying right now that one in four are being diagnosed with autism. And you think that's that's because more people are getting tested for it? or <laughs> I think that is because 15 years ago, they decided to start testing women with autism. And the characteristics that they found for women and men are different for autism. Interesting. Yes. And so, you know, girls, you know, they're like, oh, well, it's a shy girl. She likes ballet. She likes gymnastics. Right. So she's shy. So one of the characteristics, she doesn't want to be around people. She wants to be by herself. Right. She's that's a lot of introverts right there. Yes. Yeah. 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 It is. Um, but is it and and where and where is it setting? Right. It's not just one category and it's off, right? But you know, women are we're always in ballet, right? We're on our tippy toes all the time. That's another characteristic. The um wanting to be on a balance beam and move around or rock climbing, that's a characteristic. And they're learning like when you're saying, oh, or like even girls are taught to mask their behavior, right? If you meet a girl and she's just like, "Ah, hi, because she feels like that's what she should do in that setting, right? Um, And then that's masking, but women do that. And so I think more people are being diagnosed now because they're hitting half of the population, which they weren't hitting before. You talk about the different levels. Is there, how do you go for like one level to a different level? Just like you have to take medicine, like training, like how does someone like go from like a higher level to a lower level? Or is that even possible? Um, yeah. Um, my daughter went from a two plus to a one. She's high functioning. She's, um, and a lot of it's, there's different theories surrounded by it. Uh, she doesn't take medi- uh, medicine. She doesn't care about consistency besides if I'm there with her. Um, But what she does need is she needs like a sensory swing. She needs to be like swung around all the time. And that is different than um, she, she, her behavior will change. And so that can help. I mean, I, I still think she will always have her two plus diagnosis. It's just now we've learned things that she needs in her daily life. Um, to make life easier for her. And is your daughter in kindergarten already or school? Or? Yeah, yeah, she's in kindergarten. So how does it work? Like, like in, for intern school, like, do you have to tell, are you supposed to tell the, the, the school district, hey, my daughter has autism, and they treat them differently? Or like, how does that work, you know? Yeah, so she's set up with an IEP. And so any kid with a diagnosis is set up with an IEP. And, and, and they'll go to, like, there's no such thing, like, no, this school has 30 autism kids all in one class, right? They're, like, spread out through all the school, throughout the school population. So it actually in different school districts. So I think it was the 80s, Bellevue, like Lake Washington school district was the first to implement atypical and typical kids together because they learned that the atypical kids grew in like academia where um, typical. So yeah, that was atypical. And then the typical kids um, gained more empathy. By being together. Yeah, I could definitely see the pros and cons of doing both ways. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if you put them all together, the pros, like, you know, they're with their same type of people. They're not different. They learn, you know. And, but then again, if you put them, the con is, like, they don't know how to deal with society, right? Because in a society, like, everyone's, you know, oh, my God, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, think, I think that's what's phenomenal about integration and then having someone come in for 20 minutes or being taken out for 20 minutes, right? My, my daughter does not feel different. No kid should ever, ever feel like they are excluded from other kids that are their age at all, ever. Um, when you do, you start putting them in this box and they're going to be that person you tell them to be. And so when you have them together, they get to be together. And those kids, right? We didn't grow up this way, right? We grew up to ask questions. We, or not even ask questions. We like disability was when she got her diagnosis, it was the first time I entered into the disability world. Why was that the first time I was entered into the disability world? Because that is what's wrong. We all think differently. We all do not take perfect like tests don't right we we learn 
differently. We experience life differently. And so saying that, oh, because this kid is having a difficult time learning English and you're going to take them out. I, I mean, or if this kid needs to be on a seat that wobbles, put a seat that wobbles in the classroom, right? Like, do they need to be in a swing? And does it disturb another kid? If the other person, if, if it disturbs a kid or an adult that a kid is happy in a swing and they can actually study better and they can learn better, you can teach that kid empathy, right? I mean, saying, hey, like, yes. Or, I mean, it could be distracting because the movements, I, I get the movements, right? But I'm talking about a sensory swing, so I wouldn't be moving too much, right? Just it kind of like hugs them. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm very extremely passionate that we should. Uh, so, no, each kid probably needs their own personal needs, right? But economically, how does the school district pay for that, right? I mean, how, how does the school district like, like, actually like, pay money to all these different needs and stuff, right? I, you think it's something that we need to, pay, need to pay for? Societies need to figure out a way how to do it. I think every kid should have an IEP. What is, what's an IEP? Um, it's, why am I forgetting the first name? Individualized education plan. And I think every kid should have an IEP. I think there are, every kid has pluses and minuses that they do well in in every single curriculum at every point in time of their life. We have no idea what's going on in their home. We have no idea what's going on in their mind. But if we can help them and we have an individualized plan that works with their strengths and we can excel their strengths, right? It, it, that's what we need. I mean, we need to invest in our kids. As a society, we need to invest in mothers and we need to invest in kids because that's what makes our society. Uh, and so taking away like, being like, yeah, need to be a working mom, like, great. I'm an awesome working mom, but I cannot do it all. No one can, right? And kids, kids need support. And so we're all in our individualized houses, all like being able to multitask on, you know, the TV and our phone and our kid all at the same time, right? Um, we have enough money out there. Why are we just not supporting the children? I tell my support, I'm like, like, you don't know what's going on at home. Like, you know, like, like example, I use like, you know, if, if uh, some of the ninth grade is struggling with algebra and their mother is a single mother who like dropped out of high school, like, how is she going to help them? Right. Yeah. Probably not versus someone who's like struggling in algebra and their parents, are, two parents don't match teachers in college, you know, like, it's, it's, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's life, but no, the way it's not fair. Right. And how do you balance that out? You know? Right. And so, you know, that kid's not dumb and that mom is not dumb. Right. And so why, like, don't pity them, support them, uh, like support them in the school, support them at home. Like it, don't give that kid a less opportunity in the world just because, you know, and she might be really good at English, right? We have no idea what her strengths are and we don't know what his strengths are. Like he might be bad. Like they could both be really good at English. So like I, I consider myself a capitalist, right? But one thing I always thought was unfair or not right is like, we're, like if, if you have a rich school district, right? The schools get paid off property tax. You have a rich school district, the property tax gives them all this advantage, right? For a poor, poor economic neighborhood, their property tax is like nothing and they have no resources, right? Mm -hmm. I always thought it would be some kind of way to fix that, right? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm against socialism. I don't think it's like, I don't know how you fix that, right? Like, but to me, it's like inherently unfair, like, because this rich neighborhood is a bunch of millionaires houses worth five hundred thousand dollars they get better education than people in the other neighborhood right oh yeah um yeah i mean i love capitalism i get it but why do we struggle with housing and food and water like why are like an internet right i mean you can go to different countries and they have internet for the whole country and there you go it's done like best you go to asia like i came from vietnam i've been in korea for three years yeah the internet makes us look like AOL, which, like we're still in AOL. It's like ridiculously fast. Like, and it's not, it's, it's like, and everyone has it. From the poorest person to the richest billionaire, mm -hmm. they have the same access to the same internet. It's so fast. It's, and we like, like the AOL over here still, we don't realize it. Yeah. And then that's if, if you're in Seattle, San Francisco, you have decent internet. But if you live like, you know, like Farmville, Kansas, you know, biggest city 20, 30 miles away, 
you better hope you have Hughes Net or Open Link or something. Yeah, and like beep 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 beep, beep whatever that sound is. Um, no, it's it's true. So the fact that we don't even have internet, or if someone's struggling for housing, I mean that that doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Or the quality of water someone is drinking, and then they have to go and study the same material. They have the same tests that they have to take, yeah. and you know they're they're. I come from Michigan. Their water, like the toxicity. Yeah. Yeah. So how are those kids ever going to get higher test scores no. than the kids in Oakland County, which it used to be like richest county in America? I think what makes it worse, like you, you, you take somebody from, we'll say a rich school district, right? Mm-hmm. They have all the private techs, and then the parents are still, I like, give money, you know, donate money, mm-hmm. different things. Or you coming from like a, a economic disadvantaged background, those parents have no money to donate. Yeah, it makes it even worse. Well, but think about middle class, right? So middle class, you're still in a society and you're still trying to supplement and things are being taken away from you. I mean, you got all the money in the world. Of course, that's why we're capitalists, right? Like we want to be able to have the things that was difficult to see, right? I mean, but everyone needs that. Um. And I you could have asked me 15 years ago and I would have gave you a completely different answer. But I've, I've lived both. Yeah. Lived all three. I'm, <laughs> I, everyone should just have housing and clean water. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it drives me crazy. Like, you know, the Michigan thing, it's not going on for years, right? Couldn't fix the water. And then I think it was, I think it was Jackson, Mississippi a couple years ago. The water was no water at all in Jackson, Mississippi. Something happened there. Mm-hmm. I remember when, um, Deion, Deion Sanders was a coaster and his players actually had to like, like shower and like take baths and like swimming pool water because the water didn't work or something crazy like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could totally see that. And then I remember growing up, my mom had to put dye in the bath so I didn't get weirded out that the water was a different color. I mean, it. Why? And so from <laughs> seventh grade to high school, I lived in a town called Odessa, Texas, in West Texas, like over country. Okay. And, and living there, like the water is not clear. It's kind of like brownish, right? Yeah, yeah. And like when you're there, you don't really know it's right. It's like drink it, whatever. When you leave and come back, you're like, how in the world did I drink this right? If you come back, it's like almost like this color, this bourbon, right? The taste is horrible. Yeah. And like everyone's teeth all jacked up because the, the, the stuff in the water erodes their teeth and turns it brown. Yeah. When you're there, it's like it's normal, right? And then you leave and come back, oh my God, like this is horrible, right? Do you get sick when you start drinking that water again if you've been gone away? So there's, well? a, there's a thing, there's a lawsuit, a lot of lawsuits where like people are just doing the, like oil companies and petrochemical companies because of that, right? Of course, they're the number one because, like, you know, like nonprofits try to sue and like they have all the rich lawyers and stuff, you know. But then again, you know, um, oil, yeah. oil field pays good money, right? So, hey, but it's clean water. It's a kid's yeah. mom. It's a, I mean, so many different people have been affected just because, I mean, look at right now how many degrees of ocean water should there be? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and amazing. Flint, Michigan, it took so, so long to fix that. I don't think it's still fixed, right? Like, just yeah, yeah. I don't. I think we just stopped talking about it. And yeah, Flint has a lot of interesting. I mean, right? I study kids and and trauma, and so they're like one in four are kids are being abused there. Um, and you wonder, it's like, well, what's the water that's been in these people's brains, yeah. right? And yeah, I was watching, I was listening to a Joe Rogan podcast today. He's talking to Sam Altman. And Joe Rogan was talking about where, like, each each week we eat, for all the plastic we eat, we, we get it, we put a credit card of plastic in our body every week. He, he was, they were filming on the screen, right? I mean, over a lifetime, that's a lot of plastic. In your body. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're starting to become plastic, right? Uh, which is, I was watching like it's supposed to be the happiest places in the world, right? And it's on Netflix, I forgot what it's called, but, and they, they go through these different countries. Like, yes, you know, they're super happy and, you know, they talk to the, the older people, they have the cent- centurions, right? They're all over 100. Um, and I think it's four or five different locations. I, I watched three of them, but each segment, the younger kids had plastic little containers of food that they were eating out of. I mean, you talked to the older people and they were like, yes, like if someone was running out of money, like, you know, they had a, they had a group of people, you had your village, 
you had a group of people. And if someone had, like, if they lost their job for a period, you would help them find a job, but you would also help pay for things. Right. And then they would do it back for you. It's this, this community. Right. And no one took advantage of it because they made sure you also didn't take advantage of it. Right. You just supported each other and getting a job and supporting like the entire family. And they talked about the healthy food that they're eating, right? And then you literally see a Coke bottle next to, you know, a 20-year-old. I mean, those cultures, they might be 105 now, but what are they going to be 95 years from now? I mean, how much plastic have we destroyed? Yeah, like what, what's the cost going to be in the future for convenience, right? Right. I mean, yeah. And that's crazy about my love of efficiency and but how much I love hand washing my clothes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, just the joy of taking care of the clothes that I have. It's not efficient. I mean, I can't do that. I can't just put them in the sun and dry them. <laughs> um, but, you know, and when Amy has her has her altropia come out, like, yeah. yes, I will totally, you know, buy it. That sounds cool. But the joy of the inefficiency of just taking care of the clothes that I wear that cover my body and the food that I take care of and being slow with that and enjoy it. I mean, there's something to be said, like go to like a farmer's market every day, get the fruit, vegetables and meat and go home and cook it versus like, you know, mass producing everything. Oh, yeah. There's no, no reason why everyone needs to have access towards every single fruit loop. Yeah, do you really need... Do you need like 20 options of Gatorade or 20 options of syrup or 20 options of this, you know? And from six different companies, because you got Gatorade, and then you got off brand and that. Yeah. I mean, that, why is that? Why? Why are we doing that to ourselves? Why are we doing that to our kids? And then like, you know, of course you're in Seattle, you know, we should have access to that good seafood, right? But if you're in Omaha, Nebraska, do you really have a right to have like fresh <laughs> crab legs, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Well, and I wonder if we could set it up like, you don't have to have access to crab legs every single day, yeah. right? But if Nebraska, why not give the opportunity? But let's have like crab leg season, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. why do we need strawberries every single day? Yeah. We only need strawberries during strawberry season. And don't dare to go to a restaurant that don't have strawberries for you. Right, yeah. How dare they? Yeah, I mean, so why are we, they taste better if you get them season, in, yeah. Yeah, in season and where they're from. So why... Why are we doing that to ourselves? We're, we're teaching ourselves to deal with, you know, water tasting strawberries because we're like, well, we need strawberries in January. Like, do you yeah, really? You don't. There's another fruit you can use in January or something else, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get maybe bananas. We can kind of, I don't know. There's enough that there's enough selection that we can figure out how to mass produce a couple items and then seasonally push out the and others. you really need like you know import fruit from like own um, russia or germany or some you know i get it from mexico canada you know but you really need like you know i don't know bananas from vietnam something like that right yeah yeah i mean if we could figure out like an efficient process of like where are the bananas coming from and how many are being pushed out you know what like yes it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense one thing people don't talk about or don't realize, there's those who don't travel to the United States, how much better the food tastes overseas. Like I came from Vietnam, it is so much better. You, you can tell, you taste the freshness. Whatever that taste is, you taste it overseas, right? Mm -hmm. Every country I've been in, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Korea, Vietnam, whatever country, the, the food tastes so, so much better over here. Oh, so let me tell you this. I'm anaphylactic to a couple of fruits in the United States. I can eat the same fruit in Europe. I am not anaphylactic and I can actually eat it. Um, and why? Right? Like that's, that's weird. I mean, so it tastes better and it I can looks, actually. It looks better. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm good with ugly fruit, right? I'm good with something ugly, but they also make, they do, they prepare it in a way that it, they can take ugly fruit instead of giving me like a plastic waxed apple, right? Instead of doing that. You yeah. Can... There's a reason your apple looks so red, right? <laughs> <laughs> does, it, does it come off the tree like that or whatever? Whatever comes off, it doesn't come off like that. They don't. And it's like, okay, well, you know, it might be not the super sexiest of appealing, but I mean, you can make apple pie 
with an older looking apple, but it's going to taste better. I mean, that's the best way to make banana bread is old bananas. And so getting that fruit and utilizing every single piece of it. And, and that's what they do other places. I mean, that's why Costco is not in every single country. And it shocks Americans when they're like, wow, yeah, we're not actually yeah. everywhere. Also overseas, they actually enjoy eating more, way more than we do. Like we're like, most Americans go to the drive through get a, get a meal, eat it in the car, you know, like it's rush, rush, rush. Oh, yeah. Like in Vietnam, like we would like sit down, like even like even you got street food, right? You sat down, you ate, you had a conversation, you enjoyed your food, and you moved on, right? Wow. That is such a thought process. I mean, snack bars, protein bars, how many people are making money just by selling yeah. protein drinks? Uh-huh. Just because right, you can yeah. drink it in the car on the way to work, right? I mean. Wow, that's fascinating to say, let's sit down for every meal and let's ask each other questions. Yeah, yeah. it was amazing. Think about the quality of life, the depression rates, the marriage rates, that are the divorce rate, right? like the kids. Wow. Just to be there, present. Yeah, we're not present anything in America. Oh, that's quality time. Quality time. People need that. So next, talk about something called um, ABA therapy. ABA therapy. Um, I can't go too much in detail. Um, I'm not an ABA therapist, but my daughter did about 12 weeks of an intensive program. They have, it's a different type of autism therapy. Some people believe in it. Some people don't. Um, and it, it can help but it also leads to some masking for some kids. So they learn how to fit in society. Um, And then some kids, it doesn't work at all. I I do with my experience that it helped her grow, but there's a lot of therapy I've, and ways I've tried to teach her to, she doesn't have to mask. She doesn't have to act happy in front of someone if she's not happy. She needs to stand up for herself. Okay, so tell me a secret. You have a full-time job, which seems pretty demanding. <laughs> Parenting two young girls is, is pretty demanding. You do your startup stuff. You do all these things. Each one could be a full-time job, right? How in the world do you do this, right? Like, are you, are you sleeping like two hours a day? Do you, you have an AI robot somewhere doing stuff for you? Do you have a nanny? Or, like, how do you do all this? I don't. No one does. No, nobody ever does. Every single day, you have to pick and choose what you do. Um, and so every day I am not doing everything. Um, and I, you know, I think a couple of years ago I could have been said, okay, when my daughter is napping, I'm doing work and then I'm doing the other work and, you know, I don't watch TV that much. And so I get to insert where people are watching TV and I get to insert there, you know, um, during COVID, I didn't have a social life. So it was easy to have, you know, <laughs> to create a business, uh, cause it yeah, got you an excuse to talk to other humans. Right. Um, but this day and age, I, I feel like I, I, I'm, I'm doing it all, but I'm selecting what I am doing and what I am doing. So you're not doing everything every day, excelling everything every day. You pick and choose, prioritize, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so how do you decide what to prioritize from day to day? Uh, first and foremost, my kids are my priority. If my girls need my attention. Um, if they need my attention and I can give them my attention, I have to do that because once they got my attention and they've craved it, they've got quality time. We've baked some brownies together. Then she's like, oh, okay, go and work. Or my one, my one year is like, okay, I'm going to go play with other, other, someone else. Like I got my mommy time. Right. So that's always, always a priority. And I think having that in, I'm missing the word. It's not an intention. Like it's having that intention with them. So that's what I've tried doing with my, with my girls is having that um, something that we are doing during that time and being really excited about it. So is it eating a bunch of ice cream and combining that with my friends and their kids and saying, let's go run. Let's do a pumpkin patch. Let's go to a concert together. We can do that together. Um, my, I've told this a story to my daughter for three years now, and 
we are now creating a book together. She's drawing the photos. She's giving me the topics and I'm just adding a couple words to it, right? So we get to then do that together and have that creative aspect. When it comes to my day job. Uh, Your day job is like typical nine to five, 40, 50 hours a week. No, but I've also had leave with my day job. I've had a couple of leaves. And so during my, my leaves, I'm able to concentrate on my kids more. Um, when my day job is working, it, I could work up to like 80 hours, 80 hours a week. It can get pretty, pretty intensive. Um, yeah, I've always admired people like you, like have a full-time job, like, you know, it's not like you have some, I'll say a bullshit job, right? You're working nine to five, do some bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. You actually have a real job that people depend on you, right? Like I said, 46 hours a week, 80 hours a week sometimes. Always admire people like you have that and still doing a startup, you know? Like I have a startup, I, I can barely do a startup by myself, right? You can imagine working an actual job, right? So I always admire people like you. I know people like you are doing that, right? Pulling it off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how much are we pulling it off? I, I think that becomes like, what have I sacrificed in different areas or how slow has a startup started? Everything has a price, right? Exactly. Everything has a price. Yeah. And so it becomes that choice of, you know, what do I choose and when do I choose it? And even the startup that I'm currently working on, it's, it's not even been pushed out yet. And it is because of my main job. I've focused on my main job for a while. And so it's my startup. It's my passion. It's what I think about, but it's what's helping me process the stressors in my life. And I need that. So I'm going to guess that your job, you're not getting paid minimum wage. You're getting paid a good, decent salary, right? What's the decision making process? What happens to happen if you start to say, okay, I can go all into my startup. I have enough metrics and extracts. I have enough something to quit my day job. What's that decision like? Mm. I think when I can leave my day job without burning bridges, it doesn't matter how much money I make, but I don't want to leave the people behind if I don't have to. Um, so I don't think it's money that particularly matters. It needs to be timing though, right? And then um, what is social network? Social networking. Well, that's something I worked on for a while. Um, it's like a, think of like a dating app, but it, you need people for it to work. Um, you know, you need, the whole idea is that other people, you, to date someone, you need more than five options, two options, right? So. You need more, more aspects going on. So what exactly is trauma? Like, how do you even define that? How do you determine what that is? Because I'm guessing trauma could be different to different people, right? Yeah, I think. Um, and, and trauma has different levels. I mean, there, there's a difference between someone who's been to war or just has war at home. Um, and what I, I think it's when you are rewired. Um, I think that is, yeah, that would be for me seeing someone. If you see someone on a Tuesday and they see them on a Friday and something has happened during those days and they are different, they've been rewired. They've, and if they've gone through what they would say is trauma. And why do you think people respond to trauma differently? Like some people like it destroys them. Other people actually like. I won't say thrive on trauma, like actually, like, you know, more resilient, so to speak, right? I think it destroys us. It destroys the past. You grieve who you were. You grieve the thoughts you had before. But you pick yourself up. Um, I forgot who said it. it was an old football coach. My dad always said this. It doesn't matter how many times you fall down. It matters how many times you pick yourself up. And I think that... One, one second can change your life. And depending on how you want to do that, I, I, it can, it, I've, I've fallen to pieces. I, so many people have fallen to pieces. Wait, I mean, how many adults can say they've cried in a bathroom? Probably a lot, right? Um, and to fully admit, to say that and say, okay, I want to laugh in the bathroom. Right? I want to laugh at people. 
think back. The well. So I found a stat, I think on your LinkedIn or website or somewhere. The stat is, and to me, this is like very disappointing, very disturbing. Oh, I think I know. Yeah, 97% of kids report they've been abused, but only 4% of believe. And that's like, that's like, blew me away. Like, how is it even possible, right? Now, don't be wrong. I'm sure kids, some kids make some stuff up. You know, they're like little evil monsters. Some kids are right. But 97% or 4% believe that's like, I don't know. That's incredible. That's, that's so disappointing. Ah, you can see my eyes water. Yeah. It's the most heartbreaking thing in the world because you that's when someone cannot get through trauma, right? When you have support around you, when you have people that listen to you. And do you think it's because, you know, they'll say like a family member or a close friend, hey, Uncle Tommy did this to me. Oh, no, Uncle Tommy didn't, you know. Or, you know, your friend John did this to me. No, he didn't. Right? You think that plays into it too? Like is is used like a member, close friend, a close family member who gets accused of this stuff versus like some random stranger. If they're probably a random stranger, you know, they would probably leave them right of the time because as a close person, they're like, oh, you're telling the fib. It's most of the time it's someone who's close to them. It's either the family or it, it's either the immediate family or secondary or a close friend. Um, and it is heartbreaking. And it depends on who's willing to stand up for that kid and to be a voice for them. And are they taught that they can have a voice or are they taught no one's going to listen to them and no one's going to believe them? So where does it come from? And if you get a kid who's gone through trauma and told someone and then 15 years later, they go through another trauma, how do they know how to get through that? Because last time they asked for help and they didn't get it. And, how do, and of course, they're not going to trust anyone. Like, I'm not going to tell you anything because this happened in the past. Yeah. Or they think it's okay. They think they deserve it. So then they just. And that's keep... the worst thing ever. People think they deserve it. Mm -hmm. It's my fault because of whatever, you know. Yeah. So I wrote this down. I have no idea what I did. I wrote down mindfulness and holistic well being. Mindfulness and holistic well being. And holistic well being. Yes. I could see that probably after you, after you read Verwave. That's where the stat was from. Okay. Um, and that's what we're trying to give tools um, to kids to be able to be, I mean, at least that's what I would get from that statement. Um, that's what we're all trying to be as adults. We have plenty of tools, but what do kids have? They're supposed to have us. So like there's like, if you buy a car, there's a manual, buy a refrigerator, there's a manual, everything buys a manual. If you have a kid, there's no manual. Could there be a type of manual somewhere, you know? Of course, of course, some of your manuals, like your parents, your grandparents, the family. Of course, all families are the same, right? A lot, there's a lot of messed up families out there, right? So there should be, there should be like some kind of manual. Oh, hey, um, Mr. and Mrs. John Smith, you're having a baby. You got to take this course to get certified to be a parent, you know? Like, or it's like, even, hey, you can't have sex if you take this course, right? Of course, that would never happen, but should that happen? Um, my opinion? Oof. when I brought my first daughter home from school, I'm like, why are you giving me her? Like what? I don't know how to do this. And they're like, you are the one that's going to give her the most love. You will, and you can make the best choices. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, uh, got this. Um, and then, you know, in a different period of my life, I was going through uh, therapy with, about my mom, right? Phenomenal mom. But I was told Every parent gets, you know, a deck of cards. And at some point in life, sometimes they don't have the full, like, and then they get, you know, a hand at a time. And sometimes they have a full hand. Sometimes they only have one card that they're working with. And you have to see where they're at and understand that they're human. And so I get that. Again, I'm, I'm about support. We might need manuals. Manual sounds great, but I parent differently than my best friend. Yeah. Um, and so how do you get that manual of how you're supposed to treat your kid? Ooh, maybe adults need more manuals. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. So I'm sure like whenever your kids come to you and say, hey, mommy, I want to do this. Remember what they want to do, you're happy. But what's something when they come to you and say, I want to do this, you're like, yes. Like, like something you really enjoy doing your kids. Like, okay, they ask you to do this. Like, you're, you're like, you really like doing it. Uh, I 
love making pancakes. Pancakes, okay. Mm -hmm. You make a little small, like star pancakes or big pancakes. I make like a hundred pancakes at a time. Uh, <laughs> and we have fun just putting everything in the ingredient. I love that because she's able to control that. And she does a really good job. So I taught her how to do eggs, everything like that. Um, snuggles. Always do snuggles. Always down for that. Um, yeah. She wants to tell me a story. It, I love it when she just wants to spend time with you. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I do. So, What's advice you can give an entrepreneur out there? Where they're like, they're throwing an idea, have this idea. What's, what's the advice that I can do entrepreneur? Be an entrepreneur. If, if when you're holding on, if it, if it helps give your life meaning, like, if you have fun with it, right? If you ever, if you're having a hard time creating a business, I mean, the first stages, it should be fun, right? Like you shouldn't have to have a meaning of, okay, I want to make a lot of money, right? I mean, for an entrepreneur, I say, what is there in the world that could truly be better? Like how can you truly benefit thousands of people or even one, right? But how can you benefit them. It, don't think about the money. Think about how you can actually help society. And from your point of view, what are some pros and cons of being an entrepreneur? Uh, the stability of money is a con. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down. You laugh. You know that. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I'd love to not be able to figure out how much is a cucumber in Seattle right now. Uh, <laughs> um, you know what? Yeah. I mean, that, that's definitely a con. Um, the pro, I think a pro and a con is that I'm making the decisions. It's fun being able to have the control, but damn, do I really have to make all the decisions, you know? Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> um, I can feel that. Um, so are certain people more predisposed to be entrepreneur versus other people? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I think people who want control, who are creative, um, who can think outside of the box. I always joke around that, like, if you're an entrepreneur, you should have to take some kind of mental health test first, right? Because, like, we have, there's something that has to be mentally wrong with us, right? Don't want to do this. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Question my mom all the time. Like, why? Why are you doing that? Like, why would you spend time to, you know, why are you spending money on a company that can fail, you know? Like, <laughs> yes, I get that. <laughs> and for your your current startup it's only you working on it right no no um so i my my stepdad is actually working on it with me and i've had a couple friends um i've taken small parts with it so i have a, I have a small team okay and how long have you been working on it been working on it since april april so pretty pretty new mm -hmm. and so it's, it's actually like a meditation stuff toy right mm -hmm. And so lots of questions like the stuffed toy, where is it going to be made at? Where is it going to be made at? Or where is it being made, or where is it being made at? Mm, it's being made at, uh, depends where I am. You know, if I'm driving, it's being made in my car. <laughs> uh, it's being, yeah, made in Seattle. There's parts of it in Michigan right now. <laughs> so it was a massive plan, which you had to like, produce like thousands at a time to get a factory in China to do it, to a factory here, like outsource it. That's a, that's a large question from, I need to answer in six months. My goal is to be able to partner with Goodwills and Salvation Armies okay. to be able to get the fabric. So that's what I want to be able to do. I would love to be able to have my own facility. Um, and the stuffed animal, is it like a tiger, a bear, elephant? Is it, is it going to change every time? It can change every single time. So what's cool about it is that the box can come out and then be put into a different animal. So if one day your kid is really into unicorns, the UI will be unicorns. If the next day they're into bears, but you still want them to meditate, okay. why do you need to keep buying more technology, right? So you can take the unicorn aspect off of it and then put in, what did, what did I say? A horse or something. So you can just, a bear. So then you can just put the bear stuffed animal over. 
the box and so, the UI changes. So how does it actually work? Like, like, just like you put something to stuff animal, like how's that work? Yeah. So think of like a smashed egg down. Um, we'll have, we'll have a prototype for about, uh, last week I said two weeks, so we should be about a week away. Um, <laughs> So I think of like a smashed egg, it has a, a screen inside of it, and that's a 3D print. And then you have the screen. And so that screen can teach kids then how to meditate. Um, and then there's aspects to the stuffed animal that help. I know it, on the website it says for kids 3D8. Like what, how did that come out 3D8? Like you did scientific research, it's like it was recommended to you. Why 3D8? Why not, you know? Eight to fourteen, or twenty to twenty-seven. Why three to eight? Why that specific age group? I specifically chose that. Um, kids at eight years old are recommended that they are um, can start learning meditation. Um, so between eight and ten is usually when they start. So I was kind of gearing towards three to seven. But if you can teach a nonverbal three-year-old to meditate, then you can teach an adult to meditate. And so that is what I'm gearing towards. So how are you going to influence or convince parents? That their four-year-old needs to meditate. Um, so we go to the soccer game yesterday, right? Got to see Megan's last game. Phenomenal opportunity, right? My daughter, she's five. She has PTSD. She has autism. Two years ago, I was never going to be able to take her to a sporting event. She wouldn't have been able to handle it. I tried like UW and we went for about 15 minutes. It was too loud. We left. Last night, my daughter was very overstimulated and she meditated herself to sleep in the middle of the game. You can convince a parent that they can go out, they can have fun, they can teach their kid to experience life. And then they, their kid can learn how to meditate when they're overstimulated. What's the um, advantage of a kid that he's learned to meditate? The advantage? Uh, There's different aspects in the traditional parent, right? If you can teach your kid to meditate, they're uncomfortable and they get to learn how to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation, right? So, if, you know, their younger siblings getting more attention than they are, or if like, you know, they're not getting to play with Paw, Paw Patrol and they want to play with Paw Patrol, right? What a kid with trauma who has no parent no support system what you are teaching them when you when they learn how to meditate is this coping skill to make the right decision you're teaching them that a second can change their life from being in prison for the rest of their life or saying no and maybe going to college one second can change their life so if you can teach a kid who has trauma who has no support that tool to just to be able to take a breath you give them a voice. You are literally handing the voiceless a voice when you are doing that for them. And uh, I think that's it. So Amy put in the chat that you're amazing. <laughs> I am. Thank you, yeah. Amy. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm sure you've talked about this, but I think one, one demographic that we're going to really use this. Can I say, I love yeah. you, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one demographic, I'm sure you've thought about this, like foster kids. Mm -hmm. I think this would be amazing for foster kids. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The foster kids who go through forensic interviews. So the ones that are a forensic interview, I talked to a forensic interview viewer who's, so she's a psychologist. She did it for seven years. Out of seven years, four kids found justice. Four. I mean, so you think of all the foster kids who are going thinking, hey, I might have hope if I talk to this person in the judicial system messes with them how do they filter life and then like i couldn't imagine like being a foster kid and, like you're 14 years old you've been turned down like 30 families 40 families this has to like just destroy your psyche i would think right I mean, yeah how do you trust how do you think that you're worthy of life how do you think you're worthy of human interaction and how do you get people to trust you and then another problem Saudi needs to fix, I think, is like, you know, like you're, you're through, you're, no one adopts you or whatever. So you're 18. And I, this might be, might be true. And I, I just think it is, right? You're 18. They're pretty much like, okay, you're out of the foster system, right? Like, where do you go? You have no family. Like, you know, like hope you have job skills. Like, I don't right. know. It's like, and what happens if you have a baby? I mean, the type of support that you have, like, 
and most likely you're not having a baby with someone who is supportive. Yeah. So how do you go through that struggle? How do you find a job? I mean, how do you think that you're worth more than what society has already given to you? Like if you're a baby and no one wanted to hold you, who wants to hold you when you're 25? Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I, like my, my hands down, my goal is for this to be in every single classroom of the United States. Every single Every single kid should have access to it. And I think that's the best way. And so are you going to like target Seattle first with this or? Yeah. Yeah. I go to market like my GTM. It's a great, great question. I need to have a awesome, sexy prototype first. (laughs) Don't don't I? (laughs) Um, I feel like I got a couple more steps before I answer that question. Um, Yeah. My GTM. My daughter will have it first. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the places that have helped her, and that's been a couple places. So there's been places in Michigan and places in Seattle. And they will also, my go to market plan is not going to be the traditional, um, you know, what it, the Jones and Foster, mm-hmm. probably what they would yeah. say is, you know, filter out this mm-hmm. way. Um, and my, in the beginning, it might just be handing out my product just to some kids who I think they need it. Um, and then I'll put it on Walmart shelves. Okay. Yeah. So, and I'm guessing like, and of course this is like a question you probably even thought about like down the road, you have like in different languages, they'll go to different countries, all that kind of stuff. Um, we're doing it without any words. Any words? Okay. Just, just visuals. Yeah. A three to seven year old. How many kids who have gone through trauma who have, are nonverbal can then read? Um, so the idea is to be able to make it. Um, I, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I mean, eventually, like there will be different ones, different UIs that have different languages. I, I mean, every single language you know, sounds great. Right. Um, but I think different cultures. I mean, it, it, the UI will have it for like, you know, you'll say that. Um, but the, our father, um, they'll say the guy tree. I, I mean, it'll be able to have these different UIs that are plugged in with it. Like, yeah, the goal is every, every classroom in America. And I think we as America don't actually have a designated language. So that would mean that we need all of the languages. Yeah. So, so far with building a startup, what's been the biggest roadblock so far? The biggest hindrance to getting to you, you want, where you want to be at? Time. Time. Yeah, it's my biggest hindrance. Um, you know what? No, no, that's a, that's a cheesy answer. Oh, time, of course. Uh, my biggest hindrance myself. Um, I definitely have imposter syndrome. Um, there's no doubt about it. And so I stop myself from creating something beautiful or I, I do it in a way that I know is not the best way to do it. I'm like, okay, in the back of my mind, I could do it this way and it's probably more efficient, but I'm going to do it this way. And, but why? Right. And I think some of those answers are to deal with imposter syndrome. Isn't it crazy like how so many people have imposter syndrome or how successful they are? So like in the last Olympics, the women's gymnastics, Simone some, some Biles, some Biles, like the best gymnastics all the time, right? She didn't compete because she didn't compete, right? So the lady who won is a lady, Suni Lee, out of the United States. She won the Olympic gold medal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like she did an interview where like she didn't believe she deserved it because if Simone Biles was there, I wouldn't have won, right? Like the guy was like, well, you won. He's like, no, but I shouldn't have, I didn't deserve to win. I shouldn't have won, right? And like, I'm thinking like, man, you're the best mess in the world. Let me go medalist all around gyms and you have imposter syndrome. Like what hope do the rest of us have, right? Right. And I'm telling you, Simone wasn't there, right? I mean, she did have the twisties. And so yeah. at that moment in time, she was the best in the world. Yeah. And so for her not to believe that, that's it's just, it's mind boggling. It is. But I, is that also what drives us too? What makes yeah. us work so hard? Yeah, no, like, you know, like, what's the thing? Is it better, like, you know, if you do, is it better, like, suppose you do 10 things, you do nine great, one average. Is it better to be lauding your success on nine things? Is it better, like, be driven by the, you know, the, the failure, so to speak, to make yourself better, you know? Well, and how do you keep yourself humble? Yeah. <laughs> like, I, like, how can you say, yeah, I'm the best in the world, yeah. right, without sounding like you're a little too cocky? Yeah, unless you're somebody in Biles, just one, like, an eight straight world championship, or something like that. Like, Okay, maybe you get to do it right. <laughs> yeah. How does she even come out and say like, "Oh, I'm the," yeah. you know, even Phelps, right? How does he come out when he was the best in the world? 
you can come out, but then how do you still? There's definitely a fine line. Yeah. Yeah. And finding that, I think that's really hard, hard to find. And yeah, it's pretty easy to cross too, right? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I was definitely not humble when I was 23 years old. And I was like, I got a great job walking around. Uh, yeah, no, I, I definitely was way cockier than I needed to be. <laughs> so what's the name of your, your company again? It's called Verwave. And so is that name you had even kind of purpose for you? Or is just a random name you picked out? Purpose. Um, ver means hero in Sanskrit and or to overcome and wave. And so you have to overcome the wave. Okay. We're teaching kids to overcome the wave. Um, one of my thoughts, my daughter comes to me and she says, mom, I had a really big wave and I breathed. And she's like, well, she didn't say breathe. She said, I, I smelled the flower. I blew out the candle and then the wave went away. So that's the goal. Okay. All right. And then, um, what else? What, what's your like, um, plan for hiring people? Mm, my plan for hiring people. Okay. So money sounds great. Yeah. Some money. Some people are into it. Um, I've had a couple people who said they were into it. They were part of my team and just kind of, they, I thought they were really good, but they really spread myself thin. And so looking at someone and saying, how can you actually help? This is when I would be selfish. How can you actually help me? Yeah. Right. Because I'm doing everything for the company. So how can you help me be able to do things better? I guess like you bring someone on where like a contract employer or maybe outside agency mm -hmm. to have you help you do something. And they're like, they start telling you what to do. Like, dude, I don't know how to support social media. I don't know how to do this right. I hire you to do this right. And they want, they want to tell you how to do it. Like, what am I paying you for? Right. Yeah. No, no, no. Definitely. Like if I, if I hired you, well, and that's why I like the 30, 60, 90, right. I can bring in someone and bring them in for, for 90 days. And I'm pretty open in the first stages like that. Right. Like I want people to be surrounded and say, you might not have the awesome prestigious HCDE degree from UW but you're into it. So you've read all the books, right? But you actually have, you know, an, an arts degree, but you come in and 90 days later, you're like, Hey, I've looked at what they're doing in different countries. I think we should apply this. It should have this sound it should be this motion, right? Then I I'll talk to them and say, Hey, you're a great asset on the team. How can we figure out, like, let's hone on your strengths, study a little bit, and I want to hear your opinion on this aspect. And I'm going to have you do this for a couple months and see how you do and see if you're happier and passionate about this. Then I'll do that um, and see how they actually mold with the team because if they're able to work with each other better. Yeah, one thing I don't think we talk about enough is like how, how like, like everyone wants to start, right? Everyone like wants to work for a startup, you know, and, you know, get the, all the super fancy stuff, you know, make millions of dollars. The fact is after six months, pretty much all of them leave, right? Because like that, you know, because there's no money, no funding's been raised, right? Mm -hmm. You can't expect someone to work for you for free for six months, right? Mm -hmm. And like, there's so, I think when you start to go through so many people because of that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I've felt that too with, you know, people are working and we're, we're trying to get, we're trying to raise money. And then they're like, well, we can't do this because I need money and this money right away. And, you know, so I can't, I can't worry about money that's coming from six, six months from now or even a year from, now, right? And it's like, well, I get that, but that's also how you pick and choose people who are passionate about the product because they don't have to work full time on it. They can work five minutes a week, but if they're passionate about it and they want to put the five minutes in, that sounds great, right? We'll bring you in when we can help pay your bills. Like I get that. Um, keeping them in, again, it's interesting and extra snack value and where I am located in my family and my life and what I'm doing with the company, right? So if I feel like I'm doing a, like a, if I'm working on it full force, getting a lot of things done, um, you know, I, I don't know. It, if they're good people, I'll give them a break. I, I would love to be able to have the money to be able to pay for people, though. Once I'm at that point in time where I'm bringing in money, my, my team will be built from a wide range of people. I mean, ex-cons to Harvard. I remember someone did a, a poll, a question on Twitter one day. It was like, you know, if you were like to massively raise money today, what are you spending on? 
people said, you know, tech, market, advance. Of 100 answers, me and two other people, only three who said we wanted to pay our people right. Oh, wow. And everyone else said, like, tech, you know, all this. We, only three of us said to pay, pay our people. Yeah. I thought it was kind of, you know, insightful, right? How people don't think, you know. Tech. Yeah, but. You got to pay your people, though. Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly. Um, so if I can, if I can get to the point that everyone's sitting on a. <laughs> Oops. Oh, like, did the intern do his job right? <laughs> <laughs> no, Jason did not do his job. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it'd be really cool if we could um, get to a point that I can pay, pay everyone to be able to get the things that they want in life. I can get all the money raised right away. Yeah. What do you think the future of fundraising is, right? Because, like, I, I, I had an article, I read an article someone sent to me where, like, based on this time, compared to this time, last year, funding in Seattle jobs has gone down by 35%. BCT has gone back down by 50%, you know? Mm, the future? The rich get richer and the poor get poorer, right? Yeah. So I think the future is. Like if you raise money before, you probably have a better advantage versus someone's never raised it before, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hands down. And what can the rich people get a tax write off for? And what can, what can their books make their books look good? How do you do that? Right. Um, and do they want to have their books look good? I think a lot of people are understanding that our waters are higher degrees than they should be. And so if you're, Funding anything in that world, rich people. So you're gonna fundraise for your company. You're gonna bootstrap it as long as you can. I'm gonna bootstrap it. I want to bootstrap it and see where I go. I would like to fundraise, but I need to trust the people that I'm surrounding myself with. You have to gotta have the right match, so to speak. Yeah, um, and grants. I'll be doing grants. So and it, the grants, I got, I got a couple grants. The grant sounds great. You know, you get the free money from the government to do. It's already sitting there. So, so for your company, can you tell us like how it got how it got started, what you focus on now, what your big term like long term plan is is for it? Yeah. Um. So it got started because I was falling to pieces, absolutely falling to pieces. Um, I I have been one of those parents that trusted their daughter in the judicial system. It's not so hot. And it tore me apart. And then I needed to create something. I was scared. I was so scared that when she was 25, maybe she would get mad at me and tell me I didn't do any, everything that I could to help her. I was like, okay, well, if she's going to be mad at me when she's 18 or 25 or whatever age she's mad at me, I need to have a product that's in a place she can see. And so I wanted to create a product that could sit on the shelves at a store or be, you know, advertised online, right? But I needed her to see the product. I needed her to see that I tried my hardest. And so I combined my loves technology, my girls, yoga, and found that's what kids need. And if I'm able to help her, why not help? And then it, I just kept diving into these statistics. And I'm like, well, shit, <laughs> I have to help. Like, I got to help everyone. Like, if I'm going to be on the shelf, right, for my kid. How many people do not have that parent that's there? And it just got me overthinking. Um, so kids carry stuffed animals and not everyone has access to a phone. Uh, and, and therapists don't start talking to kids until they're usually six years old. And so I needed something to help give kids younger an opportunity to practice what they're doing. Um, and also you are, um, most of your neurons are connected by the time you're five. So if, you, if you've gone through something traumatic before you're five, um, it can rewire your brain, but meditation can help uh, 
rewire it so you process you can process things healthier um and like like how long should a kid meditate does that matter um no no um you know kids can meditate for five minutes you know what my goal my goal is for the toy my goal is it, it can be like slam proof and you can throw it right it's to get a kid that would throw it to not throw it um so if a kid can meditate for a breath like i said one second can change the rest of your life if a kid can meditate for a breath they can change the course of their life and why a stuffed animal versus like a doll or action figure? Hard. I mean, they need to be snuggled. I love snuggles. Kids love snuggles, right? I mean, yeah. most of us do. Some, some of us don't like snuggles, but they don't like snuggles. And, you know, <laughs> all the stuffed animal can give them snuggles. <laughs> yeah. So what's, if you could, what, plan, what, what's a perfect day for you? The perfect day for me? Um, the perfect day, which is interesting. I, you know, I love, I love waking up, making pancakes with kids. Be the first off, right? Mm. No, no, it's, I mean, I love waking up and I love snuggling with them, but I love the sunrise. Like if I could actually wake up, you know, I, I think it would be traveling. I love like the islands the not Orcas, but Lopez. I love Lopez. Um, and so yeah, waking up, seeing the water, I need to be in the water. Um, so I guess a perfect day, you know, waking up, snuggling with them. I, you know, what? okay. I could see that making some pancakes before sunrise. I have to be <laughs> somewhere though. I have to be in a, different place like if I'm camping or if I'm you know renting like a, a little one bedroom you, you know what I mean like yeah. something I need that that's what I need or t- in a tent or whatever right um I need to be with nature so I need to wake up and if there's an access to like making some pancakes or making some cereal like just enjoying our time together um getting going to a farmer's market, getting some food that's fresh, that's local from the area. Um, and then jumping in the water, no matter how cold it is. Um, being in a sauna afterwards, taking a big bubble bath. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, reading a good fire, a big blanket. <laughs> um, pancakes, but I like my nighttime pancakes. Okay. So I, I don't want to wake up and uh, cook. Yeah, we make a lot of nighttime pancakes. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think there's this uh, protein bar, of course. I'm American, <laughs> capitalistic. Uh, I love my protein bars, my breakfast. Um, if someone's making me breakfast in bed, I will take the breakfast in bed. Okay. Yeah, if my kids bring, you know, I'm good with that. Um, but yeah, that's. That's a perfect day. It's just slowing down. Nothing. So you've done a few startups. What's something like when you did when you first started doing this, like you kind of struggled with it, was really hard for you. But now you're like, why did I struggle with that? that customer that discovery. Person, like, oh. Customer discovery. Yeah, customer discovery. Um, yes. Very, very difficult for me. Um I'm, because I didn't know the plan. Um and maybe that's a little bit of narcissism in me. I hope not. I'm really working on that, you know? <laughs> um, um, but yeah, no, it's just um, understanding the steps. It, that was really hard for me. Um, writing. Writing was hard. I'm a creative writer, but writing pitch. Pitch was really hard for me. 30 second pitch. I couldn't come up with that for nothing. <laughs> Um, and now I can, yeah, I can help other people bring story, their stories to life, which is really cool. And how much networking do you do? I used to do a lot. Um, now I feel like the more I spend on networking, the less time, the less time I'm actually spending on 
building the yeah, product like, I'm talking like, about. How do people balance that right? Because obviously you need a network because like you need people, put your stuff out there. Mm-hmm. But then again, you know, I, like I know people like, I mean, if you, you thought about it, you could do a network event in Seattle every day. There's, there's always something oh, going on, right? Yeah. But then like, how do you balance like meeting people, networking versus like you say, building your product? Right? Yeah. So I think in the first stage, like you got, like if you already know like kind of steps how to build a business, right? If you're in the customer discovery, I think you have to network. You have to talk to people. You have to see it's already out there, right? Test the product, test the people. And then you hone in on the prototype. And then you go around to all the networking events and say, hey, I have this prototype. Check it out, right? Because then you're just not talking the talk. You're walking the talk, right? Um, Or walking walking the walk. (laughs) Um, And so that way then you need to separate your time. And I think that's what's phenomenal actually about this day and age and even Seattle is that you can say, hey, this was great, but I'm not going to be able to make it this time. The best advice I got from someone was said, we will always be here, do what you need to do. And so, and that's true. And if they're not there for like two months or you missed a connection, if the connection is supposed to be there, it will be there because especially networking in Seattle, you meet one people, you can get down the chain. And Do you have any go-to networking events in Seattle that you can recommend? My go-to? Yeah. Mm. The Artemis the, um, so for women in business. She's part of UW. I think she's pretty, she's pretty good. Amy, honestly, it's Amy. Amy? Amy yeah. Johnson. Yes. Yeah. She's like, yeah, I'm a big fan of her. Yeah. Like if you need someone she's or she's something. So, so bold, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, she will, she'll put you where you, she will tell you where you need to be, yeah. which is really nice. So I, li- I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's my, that's my go-to. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, yeah. She, she does some, some amazing things. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's amazing. I mean, people are doing amazing things, right? In, in entrepreneur world, like you meet someone, like you you you'll be able to what? Like I would never thought you to do that, you know? Yeah, yeah, and it's pretty interesting. Then you hear some stupid ideas too, don't you? I mean, like, <laughs> like, like, do like man, my pet peeve, some of my pet peeves, like, do we really need another like food delivery app? Yeah, I know. Do we really need another, you know, cuddle bicycle, <laughs> a sidewalk not being used, you know? Mm-hmm. Do we really need another, my biggest, do we really need another HR recruiting app? You know, so many out there. Well, a t-shirt, you know, but it, we get to have fun. And if it's a stepping stone and if it's a stupid idea yeah. or it's fun, it's helping them learn. Right. I don't know. I just think, you know, like what, like what problem is tech really solving, right? Just, I think too many tech people solve, like, I won't say a bullshit problem, but like, you know, like I said, another, you know, delivery app, you know. Is tech really solving like big problems, right? Does it solve the big problems? Jason, what are the big problems to you? I mean, that's a good question. Of course, being a sales person comes to mind is homelessness, homelessness, yeah. um, a lot of diversity stuff, um, getting to space, you know, making life better. Yeah. Is getting to space the biggest problem or is trying to figure out a way that we don't actually have to get into space, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm all about the space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's what, yeah. And then like do, v, do VCs and investors, are they like, do they even want to invest in like, you know, those like, what's it called? Um, moon projects, right? They don't want to invest in that, you're like, because like you invest in the moon project, probably gonna get the return on investment. If you invest in a delivery app, you might where we all get the return on your investment. Yeah, I mean, or they just care about software, they don't care about hardware. And so if you advertise, like if you just add software to your project, then they're like, Oh, that's fascinating, that's phenomenal. Like, did you even do the customer discovery? Like, yeah, I, well, now, well, now, well, I think last year they wouldn't want to be a web three company. Now everyone wants to be an AI company. Yeah. Yeah. So you get to the point. I mean, of course, I use that fancy little lingo with Burr Wave. It's an AI meditation education. Do I write? <laughs> I'm jumping on the bandwagon. I mean, are we just using if then statements? Yes, we are. <laughs> we <have an> AI <laughs> company. <laughs> of course. Oh, you get to the point. You're like, well, 
Well, what gets the customers super excited? I mean, that's that, that angle, you know, you can get the early adapters, but how do you get the, the peak where majority people sit, yeah. but it's been around for a while. That's why you got a little ad, add AI to it. <laughs> so what do you like? So you're, you're in a space. Um, I'm in a space. I'm in water. I'm in a nature. I'm into things that scare the fuck. And I want to emphasize that just in case you had to take it away. So speaking of that, <laughs> you, Elon Musk has a lottery. And if you win the lottery, you're going to be on the first trip to Mars. Okay. You win the lottery. Mm-hmm. And you and you say your kids are grown, right? They're like 19, 25 right. years yeah, old. Perfect. They're not, of course, you ask me that. Yeah, because yeah. I'm like, they're like 20 years of future. Trying to figure out how to get Mars. Yeah. You win the lottery. Mm-hmm. You going? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Hands down. Even though it'd be gone for two years, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to be gone two years anyways because my sailing trip. Okay. Yes. So you so, have to sacrifice your sailing trip. So yeah, everyone's already know. Like if they want to see me, they can see, they can either hop on the boat or they can fly to the country okay. that I'm going to be like docking at. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I'm in Mars, I'm in Mars for okay. a couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Why not? So easy. Easy decision. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And, and mama needs her time. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, is there anything else that I asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about that we haven't covered yet? You asked phenomenal questions. You did really good. Thanks. Oh, yeah. That's uh, always the goal. No, I really appreciate <laughs> it. I get definitely get me, uh, can be nervous talking about things. Um, what should I ask you? Anything you want to, I guess. I mean, how do you feel about what I'm doing? I think it's needed. I mean, I think it's definitely out the box, you know. I, I do think the challenge is going to be like convincing parents to do it right. Most parents are like, I don't need this, or they're like stuck in their ways, you know. I, 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 I this from raising my parents this way. What's this stuff I'm going to do for my kids, you know? Mm-hmm. I definitely think the thing, like, I, I'm definitely intrigued by the foster kid thing, right? Oh, yeah, because then you take parents yeah. out of it. Yeah, definitely think that right there. And of course, like, you know, like all the questions, like, you know, how do you, how do you make it? What fabric, you know, what size, you know, all these questions I'm sure you'll, you'll think about later, you know. Those are getting to me. Yeah. So I, I have the size down. That's why the prototypes take a little bit. But. And then for the prototypes, you'll make it like extra special care, but perfectly. And how do you like keep that same metallic, so to speak, if, you start, if you're able to start mass producing them, right? Like, how do you still have the same level of care from their first prototype versus you're making like thousands? some you know factory somewhere you know i think you always care you always have to yeah um but that's why it's human-centered design because i feel like when you pursue it in that direction then you're pursuing it in a way that you're well then if your company gets really big like how do you make sure like you know employee number 100 has the same passion as like employee number three right like how do you determine that right i I can't even i can't even do that right like employee 100, is he getting hired because he needs a job or, you get, or is he getting hired because he actually believes in like, you know, what you're doing, right? Realistically, they're probably wanting to work there for both, right? Yeah. Um, I think I can get them to care if I care about them. Yeah. So if they want four days a week, work your four days yeah. because... I bet you'll do a lot better job working those four days than if I had you working seven days a week. Um, so how do I get them to care and how do I make sure that the one bottom up? If the hundredth cares, then I still care, right? What are these tattoos? Um, so this is right here. That's my grandson. This one's supposed to symbolize focus. This is like a, what's it called? Um, a clock, you know, like you run out of time. I'm from Texas, so that's for Texas. Blue Bonnet for Texas. I'm Roman Catholic, so that's the cross for St. Peter. This is for the serotonin, a uh, happy, happiness thing. Yeah. I'm Sagittarius. So me and my two nieces in Dallas last December, we got these matching tattoos. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a... Um, What's his name? Uh, Neil Tyson DeGrasse, that scientist, has a thing where like where everything in us is like stars. So this is DNA for we're on the stars. Another Roman Catholic thing. This is the chemical for for LSD. Um, it's different ones, yeah. 
come and take it from like town Gonzalez Tech, so different ones. But running into space, so I got a Rick and Morty tattoo here. <laughs> so you're hopping on Mars. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> nice. We can totally do that. I have a matching uh, semicolon. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Um, I like the other one. Uh, I'll have to to look that up. The we're made of yeah. we're made of stars. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. And so, how many kids do you have? I have three. Dog, oh, like growing out the house, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are we really ever out the house? <laughs> I mean, my kids want to think they are. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can still. still the thing is, like, I don't care your parent, like, no matter how old your kids do or what they do, you're always like their baby. They're, they're your baby's right. Mm-hmm. You're always like, you know, you're always needy. We're not more like, but in reality, never mind. I don't need it anymore. I'm on my own, right? Yeah. So, how have you, as a parent, how would I have convinced you to buy this product? Mm, that's a good question. Um, probably now you have a better chance now versus like 15 years ago. 15 years ago, like, what is this crap? Like, mm-hmm. I'm not buying this, you know. Of course, my kids said I want it, I would buy it from right. But like, if you yeah. said meditation and stuff, like, it is like meditation. That's for like quacks and like, you know, weirdos, <laughs> you know, all these you know, hippie people, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, that'd be a lot easier now, me personally, right? Okay. Yeah. I wonder if I could, you know, if I, what, what's something that you had to stop doing when your kids were younger? That you wanted to do. Mm, mm, that's a good question. Um, so being in the army, I, I didn't really spend no time with them because I always like deploying, doing stuff. Like like in the army, people don't realize like you have to be at physical training at six thirty in the morning. It's when you start have to work at five. Like me, I was an officer. I was pretty much gone every day from like five a.m. to eight p.m. Right, all the time. Right, and then that's not count deployments, training, or whatever. But I really spend any time with my kids. Right, so some way to have time back with them. Yeah, yeah. How was um. How was being integrated back into their life after deployment? It was difficult, I'll be honest with you. Because I mean, like, like even in a day, like nowadays, like, like they call, they talk to the mom all the time. My daughter in Dallas calls every day. Like me, I'm just some random dude, you know, that lives there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it was difficult, right? Because like, cause when you're gone, like the, the wife or the spouse gets used to do everything, right? And so you can try to come back and play the father role and they're looking like, what are you doing, right? You've been gone for a year. Like, we, this is how we live in our right. So it's yeah. very difficult, right? And a lot of people have trouble with that. That's why you have a lot of, like, the mix of abuse in the military. Like, you know, like, people come back, you know, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Well, that's that's a way to target, right? Yeah. It actually, you, actually it is, yeah. You can come back and you get this quality time in the meditation. And then you get to talk about the different times that you wanted to throw the toy. And then you didn't throw the toy together, right? Um, how much you can reduce domestic violence because you can understand you both are understanding and taking yeah. that second to make a different decision yeah. the army is doing a better job of that is like trying to like do that kind of stuff or back in the day it was like okay or whatever you know come be ready to do the mission they're doing a better job right now though yeah well they've had to yeah especially yeah and social media and everyone that's actually taking a stand so that's really good and for your your um your product is the plan like maybe like i see you like maybe like doing one too many like self-help videos right like use it like this use it like this you know yeah yeah i can see that i mean i would love to be able to design or it even better have like a, a four-year-old kid do the demo like have your daughter do the demo right yeah yeah and that's the idea is that when you are on it like you should be able to know where it turns on where it turns off and it should just be able to teach you through it it should be super simple right and so the idea is yeah my both my daughters so how are you going to, how did you decide how you're going to decide what meditations to put in, put in there? I'm sure like, <laughs> I have an app called Insight. Like, have you heard of an app called Insight? Mm-hmm. It's like learning millions of meditation on there from millions of people. I'm like, so how do you decide what, what meditation to put on there? So that's where it's an infinite number amount of animals. And so I correlate it with the animal. So I can give an example. Um, just in case someone else wants to steal it. But if you're going to steal it and do something good with it, do your thing, I'm right? Power to you, right? Yeah. Um, just, you know, I'm, I'm cool with helping you too. If you want to steal it, like I'll hop on your bandwagon. Um, but yeah, so for an example, brain spotting. Um, remember Sandy Hook, 2012? Mm-hmm. So they use this method. Was that their, the high, their high school that you went to? No, no. So I went to Oxford and that was the high school that I went to. Okay. Um, Sandy Hook is elementary school. Okay. Um, and so, yes. So I was pregnant with my second child when, when Oxford, when Oxford happened. And. Is this Oxford, Mississippi? Oxford, Michigan. Oxford, Michigan. Okay. 
Yeah. And, um, and then I found out um, some things with my daughter just a little bit after that. And why, why are we not helping these kids? I mean, we are, but why is that not our first priority? Um, but yes, yeah, so the UI, so Sandy Hook was elementary school. So take my water bottle. So think of like a wand, right? Look at the tip of this and then you move it. So you have to have someone out of one to 10 there. They have to be at a seven and above. So essentially they, they want to just throw the water bottle, right? So you have them spot. And then where you feel the most pain is when you tell me to stop the water bottle, right? So say if this is where you feel the most pain in your body, I stop it here. My UI, so I have an axolotl that's coming up, right? So axolotl swims in water. A bubble comes by and it moves it back and forth and rewires. And like it just moves it back and forth and the kid will stop the bubble. Once the bubble stops, then water trickles in the background and starts um, like giving them like a serenity process, right? I can take my daughter who is screaming, stimming, having a really hard time. I get her to stop the bubble. She then gets to control. She realizes at that moment in time, she can control that in life. She can't control everything, but she can control that. So that bubble stops and then she sees that water trickle and that starts relaxing. Okay. And so we're looking at, and so for an example, for Sandy Hook, they used um, this type of method um, with the elementary school kids. You don't have to talk to them. You don't have to say any words. They just stop the bubble. And that's a different type of UI. So I'm testing, um, I'm testing and making sure the meditations that I'm using are specific for kids. Um, I have an unlimited box and if everyone buys all of the stuffed animals, they have access to all of the different stuffed, you know, the different, um, different types of meditations. Um, but it's just, they need finding their way to be able to breathe. So as a startup entrepreneur or distant life in general, people get told no all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Some people, this is a storm. They get told no one time and they stop. And it's like, startup founders, we get told no all the time. How do you deal with guys hearing no all the time? What's your, like your, what's your resiliency method to like keep on going despite hearing no all the time? I think two things. One is, you know, same. Was it Ray Nitschke? Uh, he said, you fall down seven times, you get your ass up eight times, right? So that one, and then I would say my mom never said no to me when I was growing up. So when she said no, I listened. Um, but handling the no, people are going to say no. They say no every aspect, everywhere you go. I get told no in, in things that do not make sense to me in life. I can't grasp it. It doesn't make A plus B equals C. Not one of those scenarios. Um, and so being told no as an entrepreneur, why am I being told no? Am I being told no because it's a wrong customer discovery? I need to listen to someone. Am I being told no because I, I shouldn't do that? Like if I shouldn't do it, then maybe I shouldn't do it. Maybe I should have a different idea. Um, so where is that coming from? Um, but I mean, I'm also the type of person that runs marathons and <laughs> That's all the Deep things that I have. Yeah. Couldn't go to Mars, still around the world. Yeah. So, um, Code, you know. <laughs> so, where I would like to know where that no is coming from. And if it's a real no, if it's a real no, I'll listen to you. Uh, if it's a asshole no, fuck you. I'm going to do so it. So, speaking of asshole, I think like so many people give advice, right? I think, I don't know. So, a lot of it's like, I don't think any of it, I'll say 90% is actually like it's good intention, right? But it's like, it's bad advice because it's like from their perspective, it's like something they've done 10 years ago. Like, how do you pick and choose all the advice you get to know which one you should follow? Which is like, I always say like blow up, but I kind of like, you know, politely ignore. You have this life. And you get to make the choices that you have in your life. So they say the five people around you the people that, you know, make you, inform you, and cause you make decisions, right? So how you make the advice? Um, I don't know. I call my mom all the time, ask her what I should do. And she's like, 
Uh, I'm not going to make the decision because you're going to blame me if it's wrong. <laughs> um, I listen to more than one, more than two advice and I figure out what I should do. It's my decision overall, right? Yeah. So back employees, like how, how are you going to do this, right? Because like people will say, if you have a startup, only hire A plus players, right? But realistically, if they're A plus power, A, A plus player, they probably have their own, own stuff they're working on or they're making six figures at Amazon, or they're doing like some you know, amazing stuff themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do you convince them to come for you to work for a startup, right? It's hard to do. And then like, they'll say, don't hire C plus players, but if C plus players are the only people you can bring on, like, what do you do, right? Yeah, um, Bill Gates, he's like, I'd take a lazy employee over a faster employee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they'll find yeah. a way to do it more oh, yeah. efficient, right? Yeah, exactly, right. Um, I mean, how, <laughs> how are we labeling this C these C plus players, yeah. right? Like, if we're labeling them that they're lazy, like, well, shit, you lazy, you want to work three days, but you build something in that yeah. three days that knocks it down again from yeah. like 120 hours to yeah. 12 seconds, right? Yeah. Like, exactly, yeah. I'll take that C plus player. Yeah, I definitely think you got you to gotta bring on whoever you have missed to come on. And, and then, because, like, you know, it might be a C plus player for like, you know, John Bob, they might become an A plus player because, you know, you motivate them or they have more passion for you. Like suppose like someone works for like a, a tax firm or somebody who works for like a, a CPA as an account, right? And they're like, they, they're a C plus player because they hate the job. They come work for you because they're passionate about what you're doing. They become an A plus player, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's kind of interesting too, because that also... Are, is that their character development? Are they always going to be putting in a hundred percent in everything that they do? Right. Because if you're not, you're only putting in things a hundred percent with things that you do like, that's almost a character flaw. Right. Yeah. But it is also a lot easier to be into something if life is easier. Yes. Right. Um, and what is important? Like if, if I talked to them and they honestly said, Hey, this job, I worked all the time. It was hard. I like playing video games. I like to play video games. I want to work for you. But, you know, I'll give you like a good 18 hours, a, yeah. you know, a week. And it's like, thank you for your honesty. Right? Great. I will take you over someone who's going to tell me that they're going to work every single day yeah. of the week because I promise you, you need something else more. And we might be doing some good things, but you also need to be able to do the things you want to do. Yeah my my overall answer you gotta trust people when you're hiring them yeah but how can you trust someone yeah. when they're trying to get a job they're lying to you in some way they're not as cool as they say yeah like the, the need process is so flawed because you think about you need someone the company they'll want to put the oh this is the best company in the world to work for the employee of the candidate i'm the best person to hire they're mm -hmm. both lying right mm -hmm. like like people say hire slow I'm a, I'm a kind of against it. Like, I'm not saying like, you know, meet someone and hire them, but like only way you know if someone's going to work for you well is like you bring them on, right? Yeah. Because you might be the perfect candidate, but get to work and like they have some annoying habit, right? Like, you know, like maybe they just do that all day long. Dude, stop doing that. You're driving me batshit crazy, you know, like. Maybe you need a little bit of meditation and that's, yeah. that's irritating you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I get it though, right? Uh, this guy next to me when I worked, he clipped his nails. I'm like, why are we, if we're staring I, at computers. I, I had a guy like go that. Go clip your nails at home. I had a guy like that. My first post summary job, this dude clipped his nails every day. And it was so fucking loud. It just threw me batshit crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing too. Like, why are we all back into office? That's clipping our nails. People don't talk about remote work. They talk about the higher productivity. The thing you need to talk about is remote work is like, you don't have to be around all these annoying people all the time, right? Seriously. People are annoying. Well, and you don't have to have, like, I, I have an obscene amount of confidence. Like, I love myself, right? And I love other people. But, like, I get super nervous about even, like, my weird mannerisms around people, yeah. right? Like, I and it takes me away from then concentrating at work. Like, yeah. it, even your nose, like, like, I have allergies. I'm always sniffling on my nose, right? So I don't want to irritate someone because... Or, you know, think I'm sick when I just, I got allergies 24 yeah. seven, you know? So I'm like, you know, all the time. And we never hear people talking about the pro probably more work. You have to be around annoying people or you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, or. Yeah. Are they also the same ones that are annoying when you do work remotely too, though? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I think I'm the annoying one when I work remotely because I just, I'm an extrovert and I want human connection. So I'm like, hi, 
I'm going to ask you a thousand questions. <laughs> so I get to feel like I'm with humanity right now. <laughs> so being an expert, how do you do, how do you deal with that during COVID? I had my daughter yeah. and I had class every day. Okay. Um, and at that point in time, I had a really good, a good friend that I talked to on the phone all the time. But it was hard. I think it almost made me an introvert. Yeah. Not fully. Um, it's really hard. Yeah. So like COVID, like I'm an introvert, right? I'm, I'm like an actual INFJ. That's 1% of the world. So I'm an yeah, introvert. Okay. Okay. So I'm an introvert, introvert. But even me, I was like, damn, I need to talk to somebody besides my wife and kid, right? Well, even now, I was like, okay, this is, yeah. this is ridiculous, right? I don't understand the lockdown, my man. I got to I gotta go talk to someone else. So uh, it came out and I was like, um, talk to your intro- extrovert friends. Um, we're not doing okay. So, and four months later, it came out being like, talk to your introvert friends. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to come with this hard out. A lot of extrovert friends, like, they'll complain. I had no interaction. I was like, now you know how I feel. And when I go to like events, you know. Yeah. 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 And, but like six months later, everyone is like, wow, we need human connection. Um, uh, so I do think the process made me even more socially awkward than I am. So now when I do talk to people, you know, I, you know, we had a whole like two years. How did we learn how to approach people or talk to them? Um, and you forget how to, and yeah, my daughter, she likes this kindergartner at school. Right. And she's like, I just stared at him. She goes, and she's like, it's just so excited. Right. I, I stared at him. I was like, did he stare back? And she's like, no. <laughs> and I stared at him. I'm like, this is how socially awkward we have. <laughs> when my COVID, I do miss all the, like, the Zoom antics, right? All the, like, remember, remember that time that Laura was on TV? On, like, had a Zoom call with, like, four lawyers and a judge. The one lawyer like, had, a cat, that had a cat screen on him. He's like, you know. I'm not, a, I'm not a cat. Oh my God, I do remember that. That was far away. Oh my goodness. Oh uh, no, I'm not a cat. I know that you're not a cat. There's a filter. Was, you know, I couldn't get the filter no, off. No. That was the number one memory for me from COVID. Like that right guy. That, that was so viral. Like, the, your honor, I'm not a cat. <laughs> the number one. Oh, I, I miss it though. I do because I felt like we were craving human connection so much that we were being intentional with people and I, I, that's something special. Right. And you didn't say no, like you could say no. Like I, I saved a lot of money during COVID because there weren't events and stuff to go to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you're not like eating at Lumen field no. paying $35 for a $3 meal. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you get those events, right. But in the pluses and minuses. Yeah. Um, last again, anything else you want to talk about? Any questions I didn't ask you? No, I think that was that was nice. Thanks. 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 That's always my goal. <laughs> so, can you give us your social media so people can reach out to you? So, you. yes, yeah, my social media. You can. It's Verwave. Um, check out Verwave on Instagram, and then the email me at verwave dot com. Okay. And then um, can you give us any advice on anything you want to talk about? I will. I'll say the quote again. And, I'm, and I'll have tears in my eyes. 97% of kids that report abuse and only 4% are believed. Believe the child that tells you that they're being abused. Believe them and listen to them and be there for them. Thanks for that, Kate. Kate, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.